Good morning. Welcome. Thank you for joining us for the Office of Energy Infrastructure Safety's public workshop to consider the small and multi-jurisdictional utilities or SMJUs 2023 to 2025 base wildfire mitigation plans, which we'll call WMPs. We do have representatives from the independent transmission operators with us today who we may hear from, but they're not on today's panels. I'm Nicole Dunlap, Supervisor in the Electric Safety Policy Division, and I will get us started with a few housekeeping items. Next slide, please. Move ahead to the safety message slide. And we'll start with just a brief safety message. Not forwarding. Hold. Thank you. Uh, as this is a virtual meeting, everybody is participating remotely. Please be aware of your surroundings, know your evacuation route away from your location. If you're alone in your space, please make sure someone is aware of your location in the event of an emergency. If you feel something, say something. The chat function is disabled for this meeting, but if you need immediate emergency assistance, you may use the Q&A function, which energy safety will be monitoring, monitoring throughout the workshop. Finally, this workshop is a full day event with only two breaks scheduled. Be mindful, stand up, move around throughout the day, and use the planned breaks as opportunities to step away from the screen. Next slide, please. This year in 2023, we're kicking off a new WMP cycle. I'll wait for the slide to show. I apologize, I'm having trouble making it go forward. No problem. Oh, I think that's one too many. Here we go, thank you. Um, so we're kicking off a new WMP cycle this year in 2023. Each cycle is three years long. The last cycle began in 2020 and concluded in 2022. This year, Energy Safety is evaluating plans looking ahead in 2023 through 2025. Energy Safety issued new base WMP guidelines at the end of 2022, as well as a new maturity model and survey to establish expectations and requirements for the new WMP cycle. The overarching objective of the WMPs remain the same. The plans must describe how the electrical corporation is constructing, maintaining, and operating its lines and equipment in a manner that will minimize the risk of catastrophic wildfires. This workshop provides the public and stakeholders an opportunity to hear from SMJUs about their WMPs and to provide a forum for public and stakeholder questions. Information shared and responses to questions can help the public and stakeholders prepare and submit informed written comments on the WMPs. Written comments are due in just over one week on June 29th. We will close out the workshop today with more information on next steps and how you can provide written comments. Next slide, please. Today we'll hold three panels. Uh, each will include a brief presentation from the three SMJUs that will highlight key areas of their plans. Panelists, stakeholder panelists will have 20 minutes to ask questions of the utilities followed by 20 minutes for public Q&A. Today, we'll kick off this morning with a panel on risk assessment and mitigation selection. We'll have a lunch break from 12 to one. And in the afternoon, we'll have two panels, starting with grid operations, design and maintenance, and then followed by a short break and closing out with a panel on vegetation management. The end of the day, we'll have a full hour for open Q&A. Um, energy safety will also be keeping time. We have Alan Solomon with us today. He'll be providing a verbal two minute warning to utility presenters, panelists, and a warning as to when the Q&A will end. Uh, we'll do our best to meet these timeframes, but the timing of the segments within each panel may shift based on the discussion and the questions. For example, if we don't need the full 20 minutes for public Q&A, we'll end that panel early. Next slide, please. We look forward to hearing your comments and questions during the Q&A segments. Like I said, there'll be one during each panel and then one at the end of the day. Um, to ensure we have an orderly discussion, we have just a few best practices. Verbal questions will be prioritized. During the designated public Q&A segments, you can raise your hand on Zoom and wait to be called on. You'll be unmuted, you can ask your question, and then you'll be muted again. 
If you want to be unmuted, you'll have to raise your hand again and wait in the queue. We'll also be monitoring the Zoom Q&A uh, functions in Zoom throughout the workshop, so you can ask a written question there anytime. Um, Energy Safety will respond to any procedural or troubleshooting questions right away, and we'll select some questions to read out loud during the public Q&A segments. Not all written questions might be asked aloud depending on timing. So if you really want to ask a question, raise your hand and ask verbally. However, all comments, uh, verbal and written, will be recorded and evaluated for consideration. On that note, please be aware today's workshop is being recorded and will be posted to Energy Safety's website. Please keep your questions on topic within the active panel. Hold questions on other topics for those appropriate panels or during the open Q&A at the end of the day. Whether you are a utility presenter today, a stakeholder panelist, or a member of the public, please remember to introduce yourself and your role before speaking. Next slide, please. Today's first panel will have uh, a moderator, Luis Mendina. He's from Level 4 Ventures, a consultant here with Energy Safety. And then in the afternoon, Andy Biggs will moderate the grid operations panel, and Colin Lang, both from Energy Safety, will moderate vegetation management. Now I will pass it over to Jessica McHale. Um, she is Energy Safety's workshop facilitator for the rest of the day, and she'll introduce herself and our first panel. Jessica. Great, thank you, Nicole. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jessica McHale, Wildfire Safety Analyst with the Electric Safety Policy Division at the Office of Energy Infrastructure Safety. Um, I'll be facilitating today's workshop. You'll be hearing from me in between sessions throughout the day as well as at the end for a final open question and answer session. Um, and with that, I will now hand it over to Luis Medina, who will be moderating the first session of the day covering risk assessment and mitigation selection. Luis, take it away. Great, thank you, Jessica. Uh, good morning, uh, this is Luis Medina, consultant to level four. We're a vendor to the energy safety and, uh, supporting the risk modeling and mitigations. Uh, I'll be moderating today's uh, session on risk assessment and mitigation strategy the function of risk assessment and mitigation strategy within each power utility serves at the critical purpose of creating a framework uh, for identifying, prioritizing uh, risks and deploying uh, suitable mitigations. Uh, the impact you see as ratepayers uh, is confidence that utility investments are as effective as possible uh, at reducing wildfires and other safety hazards. Uh, utilities work together with energy safety uh, to agree on a certain set of standards to follow when reporting the risks and mitigations in an annual report. Uh, this report is called the Wildfire Mitigation Report, or WMP, and it is reviewed by uh, Energy Safety for Compliance and Plan Approval. Uh, the focus of this session is to allow ratepayers to ask their local utility questions regarding their, uh, their plan to keep yourself and property safe from fires uh, year, uh, today and years from now. And uh, with that, I will introduce uh, quickly introduce the, the panel uh, for today. And that is, um, besides myself, it'll be Kevin Benson presenting for Pacific Corp. He's the Director of Asset Risk. Uh, then uh, that's in an, um, from uh, EDS, we have uh, Paul uh, Mark uh, Marcaroni. Uh, he's the President of uh, Bear Valley. Elia Jones from Liberty, Senior Manager, Wildfire Prevention. Zoe Harold from uh, uh, the Green Power Institute and John Matter. Uh, from the Wildfire Safety Advisory Board. Uh, and I believe now we will give our attention to Pacific Corp uh, with, who will present the, um, the risk assessment and mitigation strategy. Good morning, everyone. And thank you, Luis, for the introduction. Um, like you mentioned, uh, I am Kevin Benson, the Director of Asset Risk for Pacific Corp. Uh, and I'll be talking this morning about um, our risk assessment framework and how we apply that to our wildfire risk mitigation programs. First thing to note um, is that we are transitioning to new software and new models as part of a larger risk assessment framework that includes uh, additional analyses to quantify risk, identify and prioritize our mitigations, and then also track the results of our mitigation programs. Oh, and the uh, next slide, please. This transition, uh, as you can see in the timeline uh, at the bottom of the slide, uh, it, will, it will take time uh, as we implement best practices and, and lessons learned from our collaboration with other utilities to expand our risk assessment capabilities. 
Um, we've got four main areas that will be included in this new framework, uh, starting from the, the top left, kind of working counterclockwise here. Uh, the first is updating of our high fire risk area or HFRA maps, uh, which you may hear Pacific Corps also refer to as fire high consequence areas or FHCA maps. And in 2023, we're planning to update those maps for implementation beginning in 2024. And the goal of that update is to refresh the data inputs that are were used uh, when those maps were created in 2018 and 2019 to reflect uh, current conditions in those areas and then also um, updates to our equipment or assets um, in the years since. Once that's completed, uh, we'll be updating the HFRA maps on a recurring five-year cycle. Um, and we selected that period periodicity um, to balance the need um, to refresh the data to make sure we've got current conditions, uh, while also recognizing that the maps are used to inform multi-year programs where if we were to update too frequently, that could potentially disrupt our progress toward risk reduction and then also tracking the effectiveness of those programs. The second component on the bottom left there is, um, and pause, thank you, um, is the Techno Silva Wildfire Risk Reduction Model, or the WORM tool. Uh, in 2022, we purchased Techno Silva's Wildfire Analyst Suite, which includes WORM, uh, that's uh, becoming a standard wildfire risk model tool that expands upon the uh, tool Pacific Corps previously used, which was an, an internally built model. Um, you'd see it referred to as LRAM in previous uh, WFPs if you were to look at those. Uh, and WORM is able to incorporate additional input variables and also give new outputs based on uh, the latest utility risk modeling best practices and then also um, lessons learned that we've developed um, through our benchmarking with other utilities. And so WORM is going to give us both the probability and consequence of utility caused wildfire ignition. Um, and it does this using two uh, subcomponents or submodules, which uh, together account for uh, our assets, our utility equipment, geography, weather, uh, climatology, and changes to weather patterns, and also local community characteristics. Um, and that allows us to get a probability of ignition, a model of potential fire spread, and then also estimated impacts to communities uh, based on where that fire is spread to. And those composite risk scores that come out of the model are what we use to then identify and prioritize locations for our mitigation projects. And um, we're expecting that to be incorporated into project selection and prioritization beginning in uh, Q3 of this year. Next item uh, is new data analytics tools. Um, and we're focusing on two areas for those, uh, fire incident tracking and analysis, and then also mitigation effectiveness. And we'll be using both of those new data analytics capabilities to validate or update our fire risk modeling assumptions and how we're applying our mitigation strategies based on the results of those models. And we're planning to launch those two new analytics capabilities in Q4 of 2023 or later this year. The final item is our risk reduction evaluation. Um, and this is where we'll be doing our risk spend efficiency calculations. Um, and so we'll be modeling the effectiveness of our mitigations um, and then combining that with uh, estimated or actual costs of mitigation projects to come up with a risk spend efficiency that could be applied for a particular project at a specific site or, or location. And uh, this is intended to be a decision-making aid and not necessarily a final determination of which mitigations to use, understanding that uh, risk in some cases may be so extreme um, that the RIC calculation is a secondary consideration to addressing the, uh, the overall risk to that location. We're uh, expecting this to be included in our project selection and prioritization, uh, also beginning in Q4 of this year. And like many other elements of our WMP, um, this will be an iterative process. Uh, we'll continue to develop lessons learned, engage with other IOUs in the state to understand what their practices are um, so we can continuously improve our modeling capabilities and then how those are used to inform our project selection. Next slide, please. So uh, I talked a little bit about um, the risk modeling that we're doing and then how we plan to track effectiveness once the work is completed. Um, and I'll spend some time here talking about how we get from risk models to actual work being done in the field. Um, and I mentioned earlier, uh, to, to minimize frequent changes to our prioritized locations for fire mitigation, we take um, a, a two-pronged approach where we have the HFRA maps uh, that are updated every five years 
Uh, those are used to inform program level mitigations like vegetation management or increased inspections. And then we also use WORM uh, from the Technosilva uh, Wildfire Analyst Suite for circuit and sub-circuit wildfire risk scores that are updated annually to account for uh, the latest conditions um, across our system. And so what this allows us to do is still identify locations uh, at higher risk, um, even if the uh, HFRA or the HFRA maps um, haven't been updated to reflect those changes. Uh, and that may include areas where the risk is um, elevated outside of uh, locations within the current uh, HFRA boundaries. Once we've identified segments at higher risk, we evaluate potential mitigation strategies as part of our grid hardening program, which you'll hear more about from Amy McCluskey uh, during a later panel. Um, and I'll note here that as part of identifying potential mitigations, we also collaborate with other utilities and uh, industry partners to evaluate um, new technologies, emerging technologies, um, that would allow us to address wildfire risk drivers, um, including any new uh, commercial off-the-shelf technology that becomes available. Once we've identified potential projects, that's when we move to evaluation and selection. And for this, we first assess any regulatory requirements that are applicable to a particular location. Um, for example, uh, construction standards in HFTD areas, um, and then our own internal engineering standards. Then uh, we apply the risk spent efficiency calculation, where we can estimate potential risk reduction and costs of those various mitigations. Um, and we also evaluate feasibility, uh, for example, uh, there may be locations where undergrounding is not feasible due to terrain or you know, the type of rock, something like that, at a particular location. And so we also take into consideration what's feasible for a particular project. Once that analysis is completed, uh, we then move through um, the standard engineering project management steps to do detailed scoping, planning, and design work, uh, and then move through the, the construction of that project. Once that's completed, we then enter into uh, monitoring and effectiveness evaluation. And the goal here is using that new data analytics capability is that we can begin to develop a, a before and after data set where we can look at things like the occurrence of uh, outages associated with fire risk drivers or, or fire incidents, if those were to occur, and start to compare the patterns or the behaviors that we saw before and after the mitigation was applied. And then we can use that information to inform our effectiveness estimates that go into future project planning. Um, and so you can think of all of this as part of one larger cycle where we start with the risk models as they are today. We go through and assess areas that are at higher risk, determine which projects to apply. And then we look at the results after that work is completed to then feed that information back into the models and begin the process all over again. You have two minutes remaining. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, and the last thing, and I apologize, I'll cover up my camera, so I'll down there. Uh, uh, and the last thing I'll, I'll mention here too is um, we, we saw the timeline on the first slide. Um, and you can see here uh, a timeline uh, on the right side of this slide, which um, is showing how the different tools kind of interact with our project selection process. Um, and so um, what we're talking about on the side here is uh, Q2 is when we're expecting to finish our RSD calculations um, and any refinements needed there. And then Q3 is when we'll begin to incorporate our uh, risk spend efficiency into our project selection process. And then at the end of the year, that's when we expect to move into that um, improvement cycle that I described earlier. Uh, and with that, uh, that concludes my remarks. Um, and I'll be happy to take any questions as we get to that point in the panel. Thank you. Uh, good. Very well. Um, Alan, are we taking questions uh, after each presenter or at the very end? I'm leaving that to the facilitator's discretion time-wise. We are fine if you'd like to go with the speakers I first and then take questions. Yeah, thanks, Alan, and thanks for the question. I believe we're um, saving questions until the end of the session. Okay, very well. Good, so we will move on now to Bear Valley. Morning. Go to the first slide, there you go. Uh, you can go to the next slide too. Uh, good morning, this is Paul Marconi, President of Bear Valley Electric Service Incorporated. I'll be talking about our risk, risk assessment uh, methodology. Um, the, a lot of progress has been made in probably the last four or five years, like 
we follow the risk workshop and we've seen quite a bit of progress there amongst all the utilities. And yet this is probably the most dissatisfying area because uh, I really would love to have a risk meter on my desk uh, where I could just see what the risk is. Uh, but short of that, here we are, we have this big chart. And let me just go through one of the things, there's some regulatory items here. We have the, what we call the risk register model. And that is how the smalls have to uh, do risk-based decision-making. Uh, it's in the commission decision, uh, E1904. 20, uh, it's a requirement when we file our general rate cases that we do our uh, risk spend efficiencies using that process. Uh, and uh, that process tends to be very uh, subject matter expert intensive. Uh, it uses a seven by seven risk standard risk matrix for each project. Uh, so that's in there, it's layered in there, uh, it has to be there. Uh, but we are moving away from that. Uh, we've implemented some more probabilistic modeling uh, by using the uh, TechnoSilva um, software, similar to Pacific Four. Uh, we're using the uh, Wildfire Analyst Enterprise. We, we implemented that last year. And we were also implemented the worm. It wasn't in time to inform this WMP, but hopefully we'll be able to inform our next update uh, and, and so forth. Um, those are the main components there. Let me go on to the next slide since we, we are in a little bit of time crunch. What I wanted to show you is sort of a practical application of the wildfire analyst enterprise. This is done every day, sometimes even more frequently. Uh, so we'll run the, the updated forecast for the day and we'll look at our circuits and we're here, we're looking at it uh, on, based on fire behavior index is the initial start. And you can see the circuits are color coded based on the risk. Uh, and on, up in the left corner, you can see on this particular day, the uh, North Shore circuit of the lake happens to be a higher risk, um, not quite red, so, uh, but, you know, worth pulling the string. So we pull the string and we drill down into that circuit and you can get a circuit level uh, risk um, modeling. Uh, and when you do that on the uh, right side, upper screen, you see that that circuit is being labeled as orange mainly because there's a little tiny uh, area that's orange up in the very northern part. Uh, for those who don't know Big Bear Lake, that piece is up in the, actually in the US Forest Service area. It's where some uh, campsites are and lease cabins. But not surprisingly, um, that's where the high risk is. Uh, one and, minute remaining. Yeah, and so then that's where, where you know you would go there and address eyes on target, see what the risk is out there, easy to drive out there. And you might, if you were gonna do a PSPS, you would only hit the energize that little piece. You can go to the next slide. So then the, the warm output gives you color codes on the risk level. And we've managed, one of the things we've done with the worm is broken it out into the sub transmission and distribution systems. So, and you can look at acres burned, buildings destroyed and so forth. Um, and I think that gives us a better picture because uh, obviously the sub-transmission system has a lot higher energy. So the vegetation making contact probably only has to contact it once on uh, the 34 kV to get a good spark or uh, ignition. Whereas, you know, on the distribution, it might contact it a few times before you actually, you know, you might get burn marks, but uh, it might take a little more before you get a, a, an actual ignition. And so I think you have to look at the energy levels too. You just can't overlay all the circuits together and then use the environment to determine what your risk is. Uh, and, and so I think we've broken it out that way. 
Um, My apologies, Paul, you've hit time. No, I think that's all I wanted to say. So I think you don't need to apologize. Thank you. Good, we'll move on now to Liberty. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my name is Elliot Jones. I'm the senior manager of wildfire prevention. I just wanted to say thanks to everyone for allowing us the opportunity to uh, present on our 2023 WMP. Um, as far as risk assessment is concerned, um, there has been a very large emphasis on that over the last few years, and it seems to be increasing, and Liberty has been um, working hard uh, to sort of build out our risk model and also to um, uh, try to further develop it throughout the, this uh, upcoming WMP cycle. So uh, we are a small uh, utility and, and because of that, we don't have a large team uh, that's dedicated to data science and in-house model development for risk. Um, but instead we rely on uh, consultants like TechnoSilva to help us model our fire risk uh, associated with our infrastructure. Um, just just entering into 2023 here, we began working with TechnoSilva uh, and their wildfire risk reduction or worm model, which you've heard um, both BBS uh, and Pacific or uh, uh, talk about. Um, so this tool is designed to help with long-term mitigation planning uh, based on fire risk at the segment level, which can be visualized in the uh, graphic there on the right. Um, uh, additionally, uh, in addition to that, we've engaged uh, another uh, consultant um, called Direction, and uh, they're kind of able to help us take it to the next uh, level. Um, they're able to ingest uh, data from TechnoSilva's worm model, as well as Liberty's asset uh, and re reliability and GIS data, and that can uh, bring together a bit more comprehensive model for overall fire risk. So if you think of TechnoSilva, data as um, you know, a fire risk element of our territory associated with our assets. Um, the, the other input to that from you know, Liberty's data on you know, assets, condition age, um, reliability, um, and different elements of our, our assets, um, that would represent in-service risk from our assets. So if you take fire risk and in-service risk, then you can start to put together an overall fire risk. And uh, from there, we're beginning to model where assets may be at a higher risk of failure and where those consequences of a fire would be greater so that we can make decisions to mitigate that risk. Um, we're still very much in the process of adjusting, you know, the weighting of these different inputs, also working on um, improving data quality through uh, new uh, new methods of collecting data um, so that, you know, reliable data feeding these models can provide better outputs, right? I think we've all heard, uh, you know, bad data in is bad data out. So, um, you know, building that foundation of solid data to feed models is something that we've been uh, emphasizing um, as we move forward with our model to make sure that it's more reliable and so that we can begin to use it for long-term planning. Um, and so that sort of leads to uh, some of the improvements we're working on in 2023 in the next slide. And so we're gonna, we are continuing to refine our analysis, um, get better, more granular at the circuit segment level. We wanna incorporate more data like vegetation clearances, pole replacements, and some of our other grid hardening efforts into the model. And then uh, ultimately we wanna improve and uh, develop a robust risk-based decision-making decision, decision -making capabilities so that we're reducing wildfire risk um, to the best of our abilities. And this is something that um, I will say is still in development and we are working very hard on it as we speak and we you know, intend to start um, incorporating these sort of decisions into our future WMP filings. Um, so- You have one minute left. I will give that, I will uh, relinquish that minute. I think I'm all done. Thank you all for the opportunity. Uh, very well. So it looks like um, all SMGUs have presented their uh, risk and mitigations uh, strategy. So I guess now we will take questions on, uh, on all the uh, presentations we have heard. Um, 
Okay, so the first uh, first one to raise their hand is Zoe. So we will take what um, what is your question? Thanks, Zoe here at Green Power Institute. Um, so first of all, thank you to the SMJUs for those um, presentations. Very helpful to get kind of that high level view of where your risk modeling is going right now. So my first question is on the probability of failure and probability of ignition planning models. Um, <clears throat> and so essentially, you know, we know that the SMJUs have some data limitations regarding outage and ignition rates um, as a function of specific risk drivers, really on account of territory size, and that these limitations can make that modeling of probability of failure and ignition as a function of risk drivers very challenging. So my question is, how are the SMJUs continuing to work around these challenges to improve the data, use external data sources, and really start to model that probability of failure and ignition risk from the viewpoint of specific risk driver classes, such as contract from object, contact from vegetation, and equipment failure? This is uh, Kevin Benson uh, for Pacific Corp. Um, so yeah, um, I guess two, two areas where we're kind of working to address some of those data limitations. First is uh, we have the benefit of a six stage service territory where the models are being applied. Um, so we are able to use a larger data set um, compared to maybe some of the other um, SMJUs. Um, that allows us to include asset information for both uh, Pacific Power, which serves California, and then also our Rocky Mountain Power states. Um, Covering yeah, a pretty pretty large area with um, kind of extensive assets. Um, and the other part of it too, I'll say, um, is that it's also a benefit of using the Technoscilla applications um, because of how widespread the use of these models is. Um, they're able to incorporate, based on their work with other utilities, um, reasonable estimates of probability of failure for different types of equipment that we can then either replace or supplement with our own data that we we cover um, or capture from our assets in our search territory. Thanks, Kevin. Any of the other SMGs? Yeah, I'd like to, this is Paul Mark, kind of I'll add, um, first of all, we, we leverage the Technosilva and the fact that they have access to a larger database on assets, and then we can talk to them and, and tailor some of that, perhaps, to our territory. Uh, but you do point out a huge weakness in the system because, uh, you know, we, we essentially use the California's ignition uh, database, um, and we look at some of the you know outage databases. But um, you know our our service area, kind of like the other smalls, is, is are each unique, uh, and so. But I do think we're. Um, conservative by using the larger California database because we do have a higher vegetation density and so forth. And so maybe we're doing a little overkill or, you know, we're, we're looking at a, a worse day, but it's probably better to have a forecast of a worse day than uh, have a bright day and find out it's not going to be so good after all. Uh, and so that that's how we approach it. Uh, yeah, hi, Elliot with Liberty. I, I don't really have a um, you, you know a lot to add or or a better way to describe it other than just the fact that we are also using Technosilva's um, you know data data set, which is a larger a larger set of information. We do have those limitations, and you know we're trying to to find ways uh, as best we can to um, improve these models. Great, thank you. And now we'll take some questions that were written and then we'll, after that, we will go to uh, John Matter. So the first one that uh, was written is from Charles Madison. Uh, what steps are SMJUs taking to enhance their in-house experience and knowledge considering their heavy reliance on third-party products and solutions? If any uh, of the SMJUs want, uh, wants to answer that. Um, I'll go uh, for Bear Valley. Um, so obviously, uh, 
one working with our third parties to understand their models and uh they they do offer quite a bit of training and uh also written documentation so that we understand uh the assumptions that go into these things and limitations uh it, it's like any other thing that we use uh in our industry we you know you have to understand how to use it uh and so um if you know we're we're not going to be developing our own models uh so our staff we're not trying to train our staff to one day you know replace Tecna Silva but rather to uh understand the models and if others show up in the market uh to understand their models and be able to implement them correctly so I think that's more our our direction I I would say the same thing for Liberty we we are not um we are not in a place of, uh, you know, attempting to uh, replace or build a, a robust enough team to, um, uh, to to create a model that's better than something like Technosilva is providing at this point. Um, there's a lot of very knowledgeable uh, third-party consultants out there doing really, really great work, and uh, what it would take to develop something like that in-house um, is is pretty unrealistic for a utility of our size. Um, but that being said, you know, working with these third parties, um, you know, they do bring, um, as we talked about in the last question, they bring more uh, robust data set from other utilities that can make comparisons, but it's also customized to um, our territory and our needs. And so they are, um, they are able to work it's not it's not a you know just out of the box product they do customize their tools and their models to our territory so that it is it is specific to that so i think it's our intention to continue to move forward um, with some of these industry uh, leading experts um, that are third parties great and do we have a response from pacific corp yeah uh yeah i apologize for my earlier audio issue um so to, to answer the question um we, we have brought on um, internal meteorology and data science teams that work very closely on our wildfire risk um, evaluations. Um, and, and the way that we apply this is um, our data scientists, our meteorologists work with the Technosilva team and their model outputs to um, evaluate, provide and evaluate the input data, uh, understand the modeling assumptions and the methodology that's being applied and then also uh, validate or challenge the results that we receive. Um, and so our teams are able to perform a good quality assurance or quality control function to make sure that the tools are um, producing valid results based on the information that we put into them, and also that the results uh, make sense and they're relevant to our uh, mitigation programs. Um, the, the primary focus here is uh, for our, our team is to um, determine what to do with the information once we've validated it. Um, and so our data scientists and meteorologists give us that quality control so that our business teams can then take action based on the information coming from the tools. Okay, great, thank you. Good, and uh, now we will uh, have a question from John Matter. Um, John Mater, um, California Wildfire Safety Advisory Board. Uh, my first question is uh, for Kevin from Pacific Corp. Um, uh, when you um, when you describe Technosilva as a tool, you you seem to indicate that uh, Technosilva was being used to predict uh, equipment failure. Um, my my understanding is Technosilva is a tool to understand like the consequences of an equipment failure and a fire start. Is is that correct? And uh, did is my understanding correct? And you're you're not using Technosilva to predict equipment failure. Uh, correct. Your, your assumption is correct. Um, so the, the probability of failure component of that isn't a prediction of the model. It's the data input that we get from our average information and our equipment or asset information. Great. Yeah. The other thing I was at, going to ask about uh, specifically to uh, your risk and efficiency calculations is, 
you know, the, P, the reliance on PSPS is itself an undesirable thing, right? It's, it's a backstop, it's, it's, it's undesirable. And when I, it, your entire process makes sense about, uh, you know, evaluating the results and feeding it back into your, your risk efficiency calculations. But I didn't hear was um, the elimination of the reliance on PSPS as a, as a value to be incorporated in your risk and efficiency calculations. Uh, uh, I assume you're do, you're doing that and you're evaluating you're valuing that when you're making your uh, spending decisions. Yeah, thanks thanks for that question. Um, and, and so we talked a lot about our, our fire risk modeling. Um, we are in parallel with that, also building out an equivalent tool for PSTS risk to assess the probability and impact of PSTS events. Um, and so the way that that would then kind of factor into our overall mitigation planning and strategy is that. The hardening programs that we're applying for wildfire risk will also help to reduce the scope, scale, and frequency of those TSPS events. So we have a um, they're separate tools, but they're they're fundamentally connected because the results of the wildfire risk mitigation work will then help us to mitigate the, the scope, scale, frequency of those events that occur. Well, I'm, I'm an advocate for you know the elimination of PSPS events being part of the risk and efficiency calculations because that will drive decisions to to uh, to connect, you know, hardening projects to avoid the need for uh, PSPS in specific parts of your your grid, and so hopefully it's not just a byproduct of the uh, the hardening product. It's it's part of the central planning uh, of of your mitigation program overall. Yes, yeah, yeah uh, completely agree. Um, and we're we're still. Um, I guess it's in the early stages of developing the, the PSDS risk assessment tools. Um, and so the way that we'll factor that uh, into our risk fund efficiency calculations is, is kind of still to be determined, but it is an item that we're, we're tracking, absolutely. Well, I look forward to hearing more about the progress that you make there. My next question is for Paul and, and one of the smalls, as, yeah. as you say. Um, uh, so first of all, I've got to say, I, I've seen the wildfire mitigation plans for Bear Valley improve tremendously uh, over the years. And I, I wanted to note that, um, uh, for instance, the, the elimination of expulsion fuses, that, that's great. Um, do you, but do you still have wa um, utility wire connected to trees in, in Bear Valley? Yes, we do. Uh, and uh, we're down to around 500. Uh, when we started this journey, we were at 1,207. Uh, and uh, we're, you know, making progress. All of those connections, by the way, now are service connections. They're no longer any, so, so. Much you know, lower not, voltage, you've eliminated. Right, right. so we're not, yeah. <laughs> uh, I think even before the, you know, we, we went down this road of WMPs, when I first saw that uh, practice, I was a little shocked, and that's why we started early. Yes, I was too. Yeah. So uh, it turns out that's pretty common in California. Uh, yeah. so I, I, I've ran into it myself. Yes. Okay. Oh, well, thank you. Um, yeah, another milestone, just so you know, we did cross the over 50% of our, less than 50% of our sub transmission system now is bare. So, uh, you know, so between underground and covered wire, we're, we're getting there. Yeah, you guys are making a lot of progress. Thanks. That's the end of my questions for now. Okay, great. Thank you. And now we will go to Zoe uh, from the Green Power Institute. Great, thank you. So the IOU probability of failure models show that essentially asset age and operating wear and tear are relatively strong predictors of failure events um, that can result in, in ignitions. So my question is, how are the SMJUs currently taking into account asset age and condition in their models or risk assessments? And then are they using those to prevent run to failure operations? I, um, I can start with that one. This is Elliot from, from Liberty. Um, I, uh, I got to mention sort of uh, briefly, some of the work that we're doing with the company called Direction and leveraging, uh, you know, fire risk from Technosilva's worm model and in-service risk, which is more of a reflection of asset condition. And so there's a weighting um, 
associated with the in-service risk and you know what we what we did when we started to sort of build that out was we looked at um, specifically polls as an asset, but um, you know the age of the poll, um, time uh, time since last inspection, um, and then also the uh, amount of different uh, pieces of equipment that are associated with that poll. So is it simply a cross arm with um, you know insulators on it? Um, or does it have a transformer and cutouts and lightning arresters and um, hot tap clamps, you, you name it, right? So you, um, we made the assumption that the more uh, pieces of equipment that are on that associated with that pole um, has, a, has higher risk. And now we've got to obviously work a little bit more with this model to make sure weightings are correct. But um, those are some of the elements and factors that we've looked at would be age, number of piece of equipment uh, associated with it, time since last inspection, um, and then obviously, you know, findings from a detailed inspection, for example, if there were any issues on it, there would be a waiting associated with that. So, um, Thanks, Elliot. And are you doing any other models for other specific asset types like transformers or? Um, uh, that that's a good question. So I so we're in the first iteration, starting with that one asset, and we we intend to add more assets. So it could be transformers, it could be conductor. Um, we definitely want to incorporate vegetation, um, even though that's not necessarily an asset, but it's a it it could be considered one in in a model like this. So um, that's going to be in the upcoming phases, I think. Gary for Bear Valley, um, we, we look at these things. Uh, we haven't integrated them into the risk piece. Uh, we, we do it somewhat through our fire safety matrix, but that's a very subjective way of doing it. Uh, the, um, but we do look at the assets uh, in the asset management program, the condition, the age, loading. I think depends what the asset is, you know, poles. Uh, and what type of pole is this? Wood pole age is a, a big factor uh, when you're looking at transformers age, but what's the loading? What was the loading? Is it always fully loaded over the entire, you know, year after year? Does it only operate loaded at 20%? So that also is a big factor in, uh, in equipment. So uh, for each asset class, we're looking at different metrics, uh, and then we'll take it to the next step eventually to integrate it into our risk modeling. Thanks, Paul. And do you have a pretty comprehensive database on asset age and, you know, kind of system loading those types of factors? No, uh, that's been, you know, the what's, we're getting there. Uh, we are getting uh, definitely on pole ages, we're definitely getting there. Uh, in all our substation major equipment, we're, we're getting there. Uh, if you were to ask me about, uh, you know, poles, I mean, transformers out in the system, distribution system, no, we're, we're not there yet. And then in your new installations, yeah. are you essentially kind of yes. start to collect oh, that yeah. uh, oh, to yes. build? Yes. Great, thanks. Okay, and, uh, for Pacific. And I think Kevin, yeah, thanks. Yeah, for, uh, for Pacific Power, um, so right now we're using our outage data as a um, proxy for uh, probability of failure uh, input into the models. Um, so we take the outage history and then um, correlate that to different types of equipment to come up with uh, a probability of failure that can feed into the um, other work calculations for Techno Silva. Um, it is something that we are currently working to uh, model. Um, one of the items that we came up actually in your last question there was um, we're still looking into getting um, asset information like age, um, section history, and things like that consolidated into uh, a single repository that is complete and accurate that we can actually use it as a good input into a future probability of failure model. Um, so it is something that's uh, a work in progress for us, um, just using the, the average history right now um, to, to cover that. Great, thank you. Um, so now we'll take another written question and
do line up for other questions if you want to ask those uh, verbally. Uh, the next question is from Charles Madison. Uh, what are the reasons for the extended deployment time of TechnoSilva software solutions and what factors contribute to the length of the timeline? Does anyone want to answer that one first? Or? Yeah, I could speak to that for um, okay. specific power. Um, the, the main constraint in what you're on the timeline is the, the volume of data. Um, and so the the data sets are large and they also take a long time to process and run through the models. Um, and so the, the primary constraint we had as we were operating them as a vendor was just um, getting the data and then also giving them time to process it, do their quality control, and then allow us to, to do validation. Uh, we have completed that work, um, but it, yeah, it's just due to the volume of data and the processing time required to take some time, um, especially during the uh, initial onboarding and, and uh, transfer of the data. Okay, Bear uh, Valley, you have a response? Yeah, I, I mean, it's the same. Uh, TechnoSilva, in order to run their models, has to, one, you know, get your system in their system, so that takes time for them to run the model. They also need to, uh, you know, build the weather uh, database for the service area. Uh, and so it takes time. It's not, uh, you know, this is an off the shelf software uh, that you just, you know, load it up on your computer and run. Great. Thank you. And Liberty? Uh, yeah, I think as far as, you know, s similar answer as far as, you know, the time it takes. Uh, to you know, receive the deliverable from TechnoSilva, but I I would also add that um, you know that's one element of the of a risk model. So I don't I'm I'm not sure if the question is is asking more about you know taking that and getting to an end product of overall risk based decision making, which um, you know we're taking that from a fire risk perspective, but we're also trying to add in these other elements when it comes to like in service risk, for example, and you know, safety, reliability, financial metrics, and things like that. So that is, I think, what is, you know, taking us the most time, if that makes sense. Okay, great. Uh, thank you. And I believe now Zoe has other questions. Great, thanks. So um, this is kind of my last question, at, at least for now, on um, the probability of failure, probability of ignition planning models. So. Um, this one specifically for Liberty. So Liberty provided a really elegant analysis that shows a correlation between outage rate and wind speed. And so my question is, are there any additional insights into the risk drivers that are correlated um, as a function of wind speed, such as wire down or a line slap? Um, and if not, are you planning to kind of build that out? Yeah, I think the... the um... The correlation is is not um, necessarily um, by broken down by risk driver. Um, it is essentially uh, the fact that wind speed, as a function of increased outages, um, increases exponentially when you get to a certain point. And so that's sort of the assumption we've made thus far. But um, I think that it would be a valid point to try to add in those different risk drivers and better understand what exactly. Um, what it what exactly those types of failure are because of the increased wind. So we haven't done that yet, but it's it's a good idea. Yeah, and so Elliot, there's like no active plans to continue right. building that model out and digging into risk driver association. Um, I, I guess it's fair yeah. to say there's no active plans at this time, <laughs> um, but it's a good point, <laughs> and and it might, it's something that should, probably should be considered. Thank you, I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Um, Louis, I have more questions. So, however, you want to kind of run things, just let me know. Oh, there are no other further questions. So, we'll, um, yeah, you can go ahead and ask them. Okay, great. So, my next one is um, it's a little bit, it's both on POI and consequence. So, 
it looks like this cycle, all the SMJ users are migrating to adopting TechnoSilva, uh, essentially as a risk modeling tool. I've seen it listed for both um, the probability of ignition modeling and the consequence modeling. Um, so I, I have some questions around that, but there's also a lot of approaches in how to essentially apply those TechnoSilva outputs um, to inform risk mitigation location and selection, type selection. Um, we've seen this in the IOU risk modeling methods. And so the question here is, um, can each of the SMUs essentially expand a bit on how you're anticipating to use those tech TechnoSilva outputs if you're you know, kind of emulating any of the IOU methods? Um, and, and what the translation is. So for example, are you gonna take the maximum TechnoSilva consequence output? Are you gonna average them in a specific location? Um, factors like that, that'll inform the application framework. Pacific Corp, uh, Bear Valley, anyone? I can start. Uh, so uh, that's a great question. Uh, we're, we're learning, uh, and so just kind of learn as you go on, on that. Uh, but um, we used the uh, WFAE uh, quite a bit last year in the fire season uh, and looking at very specific points, looking at points throughout the day on some of these high-risk days. Uh, and so uh, we are working with TechnoSilva now and going a step further to develop a fire potential index, which takes gives a better, you know, it looks at our company risk, what we've, and sort of integrates their model outputs, but also tailors it to our risk profile. Uh, so we're doing that. Uh, and, and then with the worm right now, we're looking at TechnoSilva straight outputs. Uh, one, one of the first things we did, like I sort of touched on in my brief, the first, uh, I say version we got was all of our circuits were, were equal and were superimposed upon each other. Uh, and we said, no, no, we need to separate out the 34 kV from the 4 kV. And, so that we can look at this separately because the, all the lines aren't the same, uh, you know. And so, so we are trying to get down to that granular and look and not see the best ways to employ it. Uh, and like I said, we're we're getting a lot of experience and getting better at it. And we're also learning from these workshops, uh, the risk workshop, and seeing what the other utilities are doing. Uh, and uh, you know. Um, so we can take it to the next level. So I, I don't think we're fixed yet on how we're gonna use it. Great, thank you. Um, Kevin? Yeah, and for Pacific Corp, um, the first step we're taking is we're using the TechnoSilva worm, uh, the submodules are called rail and race. Um, and we're using those outputs to come up with separate wind-driven risk scores and then fuel or terrain driven fire risk scores. And we're calculating those based on uh, benchmarking with other utilities in California um, and some of the other utilities that we've um, worked with uh, outside the state of California to understand of the techno silva um, outputs that are available, which of those are the best predictors or indicators of fire risk associated with either wind driven event or a fuel slash terrain driven event. Um, and so what we're still in the process of working through um, selection of those uh, outputs and then also uh, weighting that would be assigned to those. But the intent is to come up with um, risk scores for each of those two different types of fires at a sub-circuit level um, that we can then use to identify our project locations um, for potential mitigation. So um, yeah, I'm happy to, happy to talk about that further if you like more detail, but that's the approach we're taking. Great. Yeah, I, I can can be fairly brief. We, you know, we've got a lot, there's a lot of information to ingest from TechnoSilva's worm model, as Kevin mentioned, with RAVE and RAIL and the different outputs from, um, you know, those analyses. And um, I, I don't think Liberty's at, at a point yet where we've got all of that figured out and we're still in the process of doing so. Thanks, and so maybe I'll ask um, a couple kind of specific questions. So 
one of the big frameworks that the IOUs are required to use is the multi-attribute value functions. And so this, you know, takes TechnoSilva outputs and it essentially converts it into um, scalar values to determine consequence scores. Are the SMJUs developing anything that's MAVF-like? Because I know they weren't required to by the ASP map proceeding. I, I can start with that. Um, so yes, this, this year um, Liberty has started to incorporate it or we've developed an MAVF model. Um, and we've, we've basically started with um, attributes like safety, reliability, and financial. Um, and so essentially you can get your risk, your risk score would, would um, equal the likelihood of a risk event times the consequence of a risk event. And so that kind of gives us a, an opportunity to compare different risks, it's sort of apples to apples. And so what we've started looking at um, currently is um, like a, a wildfire event, an MAVF model. So simulating a wildfire event uh, versus the simulation of a PSPS event. So we can, um, we're, we're looking at, um, uh, for the wildfire MAVF model, like structures destroyed, acres burned, and those can break down to your different safety, reliability, and financial metrics. Eventually, um, you know, the output being consequence of the risk event. Similarly, with the PSPS event, which um, previously we've kind of struggled to um, to model our risk of if we turn off the power, and so using you know customer minutes interrupted. And then also breaking down into sort of that decision tree or that tree of safety, reliability, financial. You can compare the those two separate risks side by side. Of here's what would happen if you had a wildfire, and then here's the risk of what you're going to see if you have a PSPS. So we've built that out, and we're looking to maybe expand on that as we kind of get more comfortable utilizing that model. And uh, for Pacific Power, I'd say it's um, generally similar. Um, we, our focus was on getting the, the wildfire risk model stood up and then complementing that with the uh, PSPS model. Um, and those do give us scalar consequence outputs. Um, and we're still evaluating how we'd like to fit that into an overall framework that um, is similar to uh, the MAVEC requirements. So, uh, for Bear Valley, um, we haven't gone that far yet. Uh, we are following the commission does have uh, a new uh, risk sort of um, decision uh, process in which uh, it will be prescriptive also for the SMJUs. Uh, and so we do wanna make sure we're following where that's going. Uh, we, we don't wanna go too off base and uh, and and then find out that we we you know need to go down a particular course. Uh, so we're we're actively following that proceeding, uh, and we'll, we'll we'll align ourselves to make sure we're optimizing between what we're required to do with, with the commission, and also uh, make sure we're getting great outputs for the wildfire uh, risk evaluation and PSPS risk evaluation. Great, thank you. Um, Louis, do you have any questions from folks or should I keep going? You can keep going. Okay. Um, so my next question is essentially um, really looking at the link between your risk modeling and then the mitigation selection side. So <clears throat> we know that the SMJ user is still kind of in the process of building out these risk models that can really inform the mitigation type selection. And that's often linked to essentially risk planning threshold setting. So my, my questions around this, there's two parts to this, is how are you currently using your risk models and assessments to inform location-specific risk mitigation approach? And then what's your planning threshold <clears throat> for essentially specific mitigation selection? So for example, like what level of granular risk informs whether you're gonna select undergrounding or covered conductor versus traditional grid hardening? I could start. Um, 
first on the threshold, uh, I think 99.99% of utility industry people are risk adverse. Uh, so, uh, so the threshold of our uh, whatever investors, people, management, senior uh, boards, so forth, uh, would like us to get that risk down to as low as zero. Uh, but uh, you know, the reality is, uh, where where are we? Uh, we want to get down to you know, I, I can't give you a number right now, but uh, I will say. Our comfort level is, you know, no beer water uh, is probably uh, a good comfort level. Uh, it's going to take a few years to get there, uh, maybe a lot more than a few. But you know, that's probably where where we're headed. Um, and so, but location is really more important because uh, you know that's the re that's where the rubber hits the road. Uh, there are locations that. Uh, demand a lot more attention and uh and so we do use the models to um help uh identify high risk locations uh we are a pretty compact area so we you know we actually are able to you know see our, all of our assets in a very short period of time i mean it, in less than half a day probably see every circuit uh so we, we do do that, but there are also things that we might not, you know, just by looking at it, you may not take into consideration how fire could spread. And whereas a model will give you that indication. So it might look like a fairly benign area, but if you did have an ignition there, uh, the winds, the way the winds are and that the topography of that area may cause a large area of fire uh, that may not be obvious to you looking at it uh, from the ground. Uh, so we integrate both. Uh, the models are very useful in that aspect, I think. So Paul, uh, are you, I know you've got the fire safety circuit matrix. You've got like high, medium, low rankings right. circuits. And then you've also got the, um, I'm sorry, it's REACTS, I think, or Technosil, right. like fire consequence. And so are you looking and saying like, well, you know, our circuits in our high um, fire safety circuit tranche plus like, a high consequence value equals, you know, covered conductor first, or does it ever equal undergrounding as a solution to you guys? I guess what's kind of that like? Um, so, architecture yeah, no, I, I get what you're saying. No, we're, we do look at both, uh, but we, we're not um, saying, well, this area is so bad that we're gonna not do cover conductor here, we're gonna do undergrounding. Uh, no, we're, we're not doing that because we don't view the difference between the two. While, while I would agree that undergrounding is superior, uh, I don't know that it's um, that much superior that, uh, you know, I think we're pretty comfortable with the covered wire solution. Uh, and so, uh, and, Honestly, you know, there's a time to mitigate, okay? Uh, if I were to today get the green light, in other words, I've got the money, the permits to underground, it still is going to take a while to get it done, okay? Now, you want to back up what the time it takes to get the permit and the authority, authorization to do the underground, uh, you know, we're talking years from now. <laughs> before we're actually pulling what cable through conduit. Uh, and uh, whereas uh, the covered conductor is a fairly, very quick way of getting through this whole process. Uh, and we may go back later and say, uh, maybe we should we should go back and underground a few areas. Uh, and we'll work with the county and the city on that. Uh, but, I think you know the fact that you're just replacing poles where where needed to do the wind loading, and then replacing bare wire is so much more efficient for us uh, that you can deploy and make our community safe a whole lot faster. Uh, you know, uh, so you can get the uh, the mitigation a huge mitigation in place. 
-hmm. in a short, relatively short span of time. Uh, I think the community community would prefer that uh, than for us to sit there and have that risk hanging over our heads for you know every fire season. Uh, you know, it's another you know you know you're, yes, granted. Knock on wood, we haven't had an ignition in many years. Uh, but uh, you know, every every fire season that goes by with bare wire uh, in in some of these areas is, is just you know, thank God we, we made it through there. Uh, so uh, I I think that that's our approach. Thanks, Paul. Any of the other SMJs? Yeah, and for Pacific Power, uh, I do generally agree with, with Paul's remarks. Um, the, the models tell us where we have risk that we need to mitigate, and then the selection of a particular type of hardening project or mitigation is very location or site specific for you know, the reasons Paul mentioned, like permitting, um, terrain, uh, all the other things that can cause um, delays or extended timelines for a project like undergrounding, where we could achieve more quickly risk reduction through installation of uh, tree wire, space cable, or something like that. Um, so there isn't necessarily a threshold that we look at to, um, to push us toward undergrounding versus a covered conductor. Um, it's really based on location feasibility um, and kind of the engineering analysis that goes into the, the project selection and planning. So, um, you know, up to, you know, up till this point, I, I think that we have done a, Good job of understanding, you know, where our high fire risk areas are, um, or you know, the different levels of fire risk throughout our service territory. And to this point, the way we've selected mitigations is based both on understanding that okay, this area is um, a, a very high fire risk area, um, and then to, uh, we're it's essentially a, it's been up to this point a qualitative process of. Um, you know, knowing our very small service territory, having familiarity with our system and saying, okay, there's there, this line in this area is an older line. It it's, needs to be reconductored um, and it's in a high fire risk area. It makes sense to, to do covered conductor here in this location or other examples would be, um, you know, a, a upcoming microgrid project we have or one that we've already done, I believe back in 2021 or two um, yeah, there's four miles of line that we can take out of service in, in, uh, in a high fire threat area, um, during fire season, because, you know, there's a few customers at the end of this line and a microgrid may be a, a good solution here. Um, I know that, um, we need to, and are being asked to move to, um, uh, a quantitative analysis. We, um, Everyone wants to see the numbers spit this solution out to say that's what you're supposed to do right there. And I think that's what we're trying to do. Um, so essentially understanding fire risk, using qualitative information and institutional knowledge to make those decisions currently. But now, as I was just saying with you know our MAVF model and, and maybe in a new iteration of that that we want to build on is um, building out a financial model that's going to convert those risk scores from the MAVF um, to a dollar amount. And so that that financial model can eventually enable like a cost benefit analysis that will evaluate the absolute effectiveness of different mitigations. Um, that's the that's the goal. That's the, the plan. Um, but we're not there yet. And I guess I just described how we've done it up to this point. Great, thank you. Uh, so uh, we we have plenty of time for additional questions, but right now we'll go to John. Thank you. Yeah, uh, uh, more of a comment than a question. You know, I've heard a lot about modeling and um, using models and coming up with uh, analytics. Um, and uh, I just want to, uh, I think we should all reflect that many of these uh, models and tools are relatively new. And uh, I don't think that we can have 100% uh, uh, faith in them, uh, like the, the, the comp, uh, we need to see how they perform over years. I mean, we're using them because we don't, we didn't track data over the last hundred years for, for, for this. Uh, so I, I, I think that 
I understand that we want to have a, a tool that calculates out perfectly what we should do, but I, I, I think that we also need to underline that it's, it's it, the operating experience and engineering knowledge of the people that operate these systems should be taken into account when we're looking at uh, proper mitigations and how to prioritize uh, risk mitigation. Um, like for instance, Paul, when you arrived at uh, Bear Valley and you saw the, the, the wires on trees, you immediately eliminated all the, the distribution level trees, right? The, the, you didn't need a model to tell you to do that. And so uh, I, I think that, uh, you know, I think we should keep open to the idea of uh, operators submitting, you know, a thoughtful engineering analysis as justification for their for their decisions, and not just rely on on the modeling tools until we have a lot more confidence in their long term success. Yeah, let me just add something onto that too. Um, we work closely with Technicilla because we're kind of um, we're small, and so when I see a, like a red point on a circuit. I actually send someone out there to look at that. And we look at either side of that red point and we say, hey, geez, it doesn't look any different. So then we call Techno Silva up and they try to explain it. And sometimes they say, hey, we're going to take a look at why why that's, you know, that's not making sense to us either. Uh, but they, you know, they they use satellite imagery for the fuel calculation and they do some calculations and do some averaging that sometimes result in a in a spot just showing up as high risk when it really is no different than anything else around it. So uh, we've been trying to provide that feedback loop to them so they can build, make a better model. Uh, and so every time we, you know, find an instance like that, we, we you know, let them know and they appreciate that because it helps them uh, kind of refine their models. Great, any other remarks to John's comment? Okay. Uh, yeah, for, for Mr. Carr, I guess oh. I just say we, we, we agree um, with what John described. Um, we view the models as important decision making aids, um, but we still also understand the need to uh, include operational knowledge, engineering judgment, um, and how we um, evaluate potential project locations or mitigation sites um, and how that gets factored into our project selection process. Great. Thank you. So if you have any other further questions, uh, please just type it in in the chat function or raise your hand. And the next question is from Zoe. So my um, next question is a, um, a bit broad. So I'm just curious as to how each of the SMJUs are using AFM data um, access and function leads. So AFM data and how they're incorporating it, that into either risk modeling um, you know, and to John's point, risk assessment and deciding um, how that's informing mitigation prioritization and selection, as well as RSE evaluation. Yeah, and um, for this is uh, yeah, Kevin again for Pacific Power. Um, so we do look at um, the AFN population um, in the consequence uh, model. Um, and so, um, one of the war modules, Rave, has a, a component or an output that gives us those values that we can use, and then they use publicly available data to, to refresh the population numbers there. So we are we are directly incorporating um, AFN population data into the consequence modeling that we're applying to our composite risk score. Uh I would I would agree. Um, we are doing something similar to what Kevin just described. Uh, you know, reliability is a is an element of our MAVF model, um, and you know, reliability is the impacts uh, to customers. And so we wait uh, we wait or assign weightings to different customer types, whether it's critical infrastructure, um, AFN, medical baseline, uh, even commercial. Uh, customers, we we have different weightings associated with the different customer types, and so that um, helps to sort of drive that reliability score in the model. Good in Bear Valley. Yeah, so we're aware of uh, where our AFN customers are, and when we apply the models, you know how it would impact them, uh, but we don't use AFN as an input to 
uh, evaluate the consequence. Uh, in other words, uh, the consequence is not the you know um, acres burned, buildings burned, destroyed, so forth. It's not driven by what type of customers living in that building or living on that land. So that's just an output of the model, uh, and then we look at how uh, you know how that would impact different customers after when we apply the model results. If that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, thanks everyone. Oh, good. Um, so I don't see any other questions. So Zoe, you can continue. So my next question is whether the SMJUs are developing mitigation lifetime cost estimates that can inform risk spend efficiency values. For Pacific Power, um, our risk spend efficiency model is just using the um, upfront cost of the whatever the hardening project is or whatever the mitigation is. Um, we haven't gotten to the point where we're forecasting changes to, to maintenance costs or, or things like that for like a, a full life cycle cost assessment. For fair value, we use, um, I think it's, it's 25 year life cycle costs. So, uh, and then we break it down to uh, an annual, annualize it. So that it's the only way, well, I don't know if it's the only way, there's probably many ways, but for us, it's kind of an equalizer, so you can compare CapEx and OpEx solutions. Uh, and so, because, you know, it can be very, you know, CapEx can have a high upfront cost and look a lot more expensive uh, than an, an OpEx uh, expense. But then if you look at it over 25 years, maybe it wasn't such a, uh, an expensive route to go. So we look at both, uh, try to annualize the costs. And the way we do that is through some sort of life cycle cost estimation process. Uh, for Liberty, we, we have not uh, incorporated life cycle costs yet into to any kind of modeling. Okay, um, good. So if there are any other questions, please type it in or raise your hand. Uh, Zoe, you can continue. Thanks, Louie. So, uh -huh. um, so my next question is going back to the modeling and um, to also to, to make clear John's point, it is very important, the, essentially the way that these models and the model outputs are considered and always, you know, of course, having subject matter experts that are interpreting the models, taking them with a grain of salt. Um, so one of my questions is, essentially the use of multiple models. So I think, for example, Liberty is using React's developed models, also TechnoSilva, WRRM, and then Direction. I believe you're also using Direction to help develop models as well. So um, if you could just give a little bit of a framework or architectures for how you see all of those different model types and sources fitting into a decision-making process. Yeah, sure. I, I mean, I think, uh, you know, the reason there's different uh, consultants involved is because they all do things a little bit differently. Um, currently, REACS is, uh, is helping with a lot of our operational uh, fire risk uh, understanding. So kind of daily operational uh, decision making for fire risk, um, you know, weather monitoring, uh, you know, all of the different uh, PSPS values that we monitor, uh, FPI, those are all things that, that REACTS helps us with. And then TechnoSilva, obviously we've talked about the worm model and, and the understanding of fire risk associated with those outputs. Um, and then uh, what we have direction doing is helping to bring a little bit more of that together, right? So taking that fire risk, and then as I've mentioned before, the in-service risk where we discuss the, you know, the pole assets and asset condition um, to give us sort of an in-service risk. And then build, they're, you know, they're building a, a bit more of a comprehensive model that can weigh fire risk, in-service risk, and give you bit, a bit more of an overall 
risk. And as we get more familiar with that, we may add more assets to kind of further build that out. So I, I hope that helps. Thanks, Elliot. That was really helpful. And so the React um, company and models, they were they do consequence modeling as well as TechnoSilva. And so that's kind of your distinction is you're doing the React consequence for operations and TechnoSilva consequence for to inform planning. long term long term planning. Okay. Yes. Thanks. I appreciate that. Um, and then Bear Valley. Um, similarly, you're in this merger. It seems like there's a lot of models that are coming in to um, kind of help fill out your risk modeling space um, and maybe even replace the fire circuit safety matrix. So I, yep. I read about TechnoSilva and Reacts. Could you talk a bit about that and how they fit together? Yeah, so, um, that's, so that's one of our big goals this year is to sort of integrate in, uh, everything into some sort of risk enterprise system. Uh, and uh, try and these different models feed into ultimately the that risk meter I want on my desk. Uh, but uh, the uh, so we we are seeking we're working with it we work with Guidehouse uh, but we are trying to get some sort of overarching expert in to bring together all these different uh, models and approaches uh, so that. Uh, you know, they're sort of uh, working together and, and ultimately providing that uh, output that we need the uh, uh, utility risk, uh, ultimately the wildfire risk and PSPS risk. Um, and so we are headed down that direction. And I think that's ultimately what the risk enterprise would, would, would look like. Uh, and so that's where we want to head. Thanks, Paul. And then Pacific Corp, I think you guys are essentially focusing on TechnoSilva as your external modeling kind of suite. Um, and that's mostly for the consequence modeling. Is that correct? Uh, yes. Um, so we, we use TechnoSilva actually to cover um, kind of the full range of risk modeling. So we also use uh, portions of the wildfire analyst tool set for operational risk modeling uh, their fire cast and fire sim tool um, used by our meteorology team for kind of operational risk or short-term risk um, and then uh, worm is used more for long-term risk modeling um, assessments to inform things like uh, the hfra maps and our, our capital investment plan thanks kevin good and let's see if there's any other questions um so any, if there's any questions please type it in or raise your hand there are no further questions, so so you can continue. I'll ask a technical question for Liberty. Um, you guys are using Elm Fire, and that's connected to your ignition rate model. I was just curious. You're running a 24-hour simulation, and I'm just curious as to why you selected that 24-hour simulation. A lot of the other utilities are using eight-hour simulations. That's that's a good good question and and something we've we've discussed uh, in the past and I, I don't know that I'm going to have the best answer for you on that um, and I can certainly get back to you with um, you know a more robust response but I believe uh, the reasoning was uh, to you know gauge the impacts over 24 hours um, I guess to to us or to our model felt like a better gauge on you know, the, the extent of damage from a fire in the first 24 hours versus eight. Thanks, Elliot. And have you done any comparisons like between your eight hour and 24 hour and seeing, you know, like jockeying positions and risk for the outputs of those models? Uh, we have not, no. Okay, thanks. Any responses from other utilities? Valley, Civic Corp, anyone? Yeah, okay. Uh, all right. Um, any other further questions from other participants, attendees, panelists, questions? Um, okay, we can continue with Zoe. 
I believe I have actually asked all of my questions thus far. So um, if there are any other questions from folks. Um, there, there is one from uh, our team at level four. And this one's directed to uh, all, all um, SMJUs. Um, can you describe the role of SME input, if any, in your process of assessment at, of risk at the circuit level and any instances where your software framework and SME input do not agree on risk assessments and how those situations are treated? Uh, so at the very beginning of this journey, uh, we were 100% SME uh, dependent. <laughs> So, uh, and we still uh, are very, uh, we do take the SME uh, evaluation uh, strongly into consideration. Uh, you know, I have folks uh, that have over 45 years, you know, of uh, experience uh, in, in this business uh, and the, uh, you know, they have, uh, Linemen that have been here for uh, over 30 years and uh, field operations, like I said, been in this business for 45 years and it'd be very uh, remiss to uh, ignore their experience. And, uh, you know, they, they know these circuits very well. Uh, they know. And so it's very important to uh, show them the risk model outputs and then drive out there with them and put eyes on target and have that integration. Uh, so we do uh, use SME input quite a bit, uh, and even with once we implement the models, uh, you know, uh, SME input you can't replace that. Uh, so uh, I think it's very important, and you know, then as we build out the system and replace it and harden it, uh, the folks that are are building it right now, uh, they'll have that SME knowledge in the future because uh, they were the ones who built it uh, uh, and so uh, yeah so it has to always be a, a big part of the process got it and so are there any instances where the the software framework that you're developing and you, did you have vendors in uh does not agree with the assessment yeah, yeah no we do yeah. uh and uh and like i said I, I we've like gone out and you know and then we call TechnoSelvo up and say, hey, your model's showing this, but we're out there and it really doesn't look uh, that, uh, you know, we're, we're just not seeing the difference between where it says it's green and where it says it's red. Uh, we're, we're just not seeing anything there that's different. Uh, and so, and then they, they, they get back to us, uh, try to explain, you know, like, Sometimes it has to do with the way they average the fuel uh, that they measure from the satellites uh, and just happens the way the pixels are divided on on the model. So, but we do provide that feedback to them uh, so that, yes, so that they can improve their models, obviously. Okay, uh, responses from Kevin Elliott. Yeah, and for Pacific Power, uh, I would say it's generally, um, the same approach where we do um, incorporate uh, subject matter experts to me and put into the process. Um, and so the, the models will um, tell us where the locations of risk are, and then we coordinate with um, our engineering teams, vegetation management, field operations, uh, meteorology, to kind of validate the results of what the model is telling us and um, then assess the proposed scope for a project there. So um, in terms of selecting things like particular projects to be constructed, um, that's, that's very much speed driven um, based on the locations identified by the, by the models. Um, and I guess in, in cases where there's a dispute between the location identified by the model and um, our subject matter expert input, um, that kind of comes down against two site specific considerations where we'll just sort of evaluate the location and see if the model is giving us an erroneous output that we need to go back to technical silver with to, to understand the discrepancy. I see. So it looks like uh, whenever uh, the, a framework and SMEs do not agree. It looks like Technosova has a, a a role on the final say on which uh, which way you will go. Or... Yeah, and 
at least for purposes of carbon, say they have the final say. Um, we're giving them that feedback more right. to inform their models. If, if our subject matter experts identify a potential error, we want um, we want to give them that information so they can tell us what might be causing the potential discrepancy between subject matter expert judgment and the model output. So then we can use that to inform uh, you know, the decisions that need to be made. Okay, that makes sense. Um, and Elliot. Yeah. So um, as I was mentioning with this direction model and different scenarios that we're identifying, we're still in the process of actively improving that tool. Um, some of that is data cleanup, data quality. So we want to make sure that that's you know in place before, and also adjusting some weightings. But when we get to that point where um, you know we feel comfortable about the way it's built, what we want to do is actually go out and do some you know field verification so uh, where where the tool is saying you know these poles are your highest overall risk and you should replace them um, we we actually need to go see that and verify that in the field and and uh, you know make sure we agree if not we do intend to come back and um, try to understand you know where the disagreement is uh, maybe it's a way that we weighted certain risk factors um, as opposed to to others, um, or maybe the fire risk um, versus in service risk is skewed. Maybe it shouldn't be 50-50. Maybe you should um, you know adjust those weights um, so that it's more in agreement. You know the model is more in agreement with what we're seeing in the field. So that's one way we plan to do it moving forward. And then I'd say you know up to this point, um, just looking at you know fire risk and selecting projects. I, there's examples where we have selected a project um, in say a high fire risk area versus a very high fire risk area because of the condition of those assets. And that wasn't determined, that was determined by sub subject matter input, not necessarily a, a model that we had to point to that, but it was the condition of this line is such that um, there's still definitely a, a chance of failure and, and, um, and uh, you know, fire risk. And so we want to do it here in a high high fire risk area rather than a very high, and uh, just understanding that uh, from subject matter input. That makes sense. Uh, good. Well, so, uh, I just want to add uh, one thing to uh, one of my slides. I think, and I drew that from Technosilva's literature. They they advertise, uh, I think, on the WFE sixty percent confidence. Uh, so, uh, you know, under front, up front, you should understand 60% is, you know, uh, those are some interesting odds. Uh, so, uh, you have to take into account what, what the, the model limitations here. Uh, so, that's a good number to keep in mind when you look at okay. Okay, good. And we have about uh, 20 minutes left for additional questions, and I see no written questions. Uh, I, so Zoe, you can continue. Thanks, I'll ask about risk spend efficiency. Um, so okay. a big piece of you know, coming up with a quantitative estimate of risk spend efficiency is the effectiveness of the mitigation. And so I am wondering what the SMJUs are doing, um, both as maybe internal data collection, as well as using findings from the IOUs. I know there's the, you know, the joint covered conductor assessment, um, kind of how are they bringing those data sets together? What are they creating themselves to fill in that number, numbers? Yeah, and for Pacific Power, um, it's, it's kind of doing all the above of what you just described. Um, so, while uh, I guess I'll start with two parts. So our the new data analytics tool that we're deploying, one of the components of that is um, uh, effectiveness evaluation or monitoring. Um, and so this is what's going to start um, giving us that before and after time history. So we can start using our equipment and our um, asset information, location information, address history, and all the other data that we have um, organically or internally to start coming up with our own estimates of effectiveness. Um, that's the kind of midterm to long-term plan as we start building out enough data to be confident in those numbers. Um, in the, the near term, what we're doing now, uh, we are using the, uh, the joint IOU working session and the working groups um, to understand what the other utilities that have a longer history of collecting this data have come up with with their effectiveness um, estimates. Um, and then also working with Technosilva and leveraging some of their, um, 
kind of shared data uh, for effectiveness um, to incorporate that into our models. So it's a, a bit of a mid to longer term effort for us to kind of build out our own data to then either um, challenge or replace or supplement the data that we're getting from the other IOUs. Um, Bear Valley, Liberty, anything to add? Um, uh, we, we do, like you said, the above, all of the above, but, um, we, you know, like I said, we're, we follow the framework also because that's how we uh, present projects in our general rate case. Ultimately, even the WMP projects are reviewed in the general rate case. Uh, and uh, so you calculate RFCs using the uh, uh, risk based. Uh, decision making framework uh, th that uh, the SMJUs agreed to. Um, and it, it's right now we're at a point where we can calculate in ROCs, um, we can calculate uh, how much risk is left by uh, simply determining the percent of implementation. Uh, if you assume it's linear uh, and so it's simplified. Uh, but do we go back and say, okay, we removed all the expulsion fuses. Uh, did we really achieve the risk reduction that we thought we were gonna achieve by removing all the expulsion fuses? And I don't think we, I don't think we understand how to do that yet. Um, so you could say, you know, we installed covered wire over in this section, did we, and we said we're going to achieve this much risk reduction. Did we actually, now that we've installed it, did what is the, you know, did we really in, achieve that risk reduction? Um, I'm not sure we're at, at that level yet. Okay, um, Elliot. Oh. Yeah, I, I think you know probably one of the biggest. Um, you know, benefits we've had from, you know, the coverage conductor working group is, you know, how the different utilities um, gauge their reduction of risk when utilizing covered conductor. That's probably one of the biggest factors. There's many benefits to, you know, benchmarking with the other utilities on all things covered conductor, but I think that was one of the best examples of, you know, seeing where other utilities aligned on, you know, how much risk is reduced by covered conductor and comparing that to our own. And we've made adjustments, um, you know, to our estimations of how much risk we've re we reduce by installing covered conductor. That's one example I can think of. Great. And and I do want to add one thing as a, as a follow up to it. It's just important to note that effectiveness is very location specific. Um, and so you know, we're working toward coming up with say averages or higher level values that you know, cover conductor is 60% effective. Um, but in practice or in reality, you know, covered conductor might be 90% effective in one location, but only 10 or 20% effective in another location because of what's driving the risk in that particular site. Um, so I think it's important to note that um, an average or an overall effectiveness measure for a particular type of mitigation may not be representative of results that are actually achieved in the field um, just due to the, the multiple variables that can influence those outcomes. Thank you. The next question is from John. I just really a comment. Um, I think this is a very difficult area to, to assess. Uh, how do you prove something didn't happen because you did something, right? That, 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 that's difficult. And um, we, we haven't been keeping track of the number of operating hours per you know, exempt lightning arrestor since the beginning of uh, the inception. So we don't have like hours of performance equals uh, X number of uh, voided uh, fire starts. So, you know, we, we don't have that, that information. We haven't been tracking. And even if we started tracking it, it would probably take 10, 15, 20 years for us to be, to be able to rely because we'd have to discern from the different uh, topographies and, and different things, right? So. So I think that um, I, I, I just have to plug again, you know, the good old fashioned engineering analysis and doing the, that, that's gotta be a part of this is an assessment of people that operate and engineer the system. Um, for instance, you know, the, 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 PS, the, the fast trip curves that have been put on, 
you know, those obviously contributed to reduction in the number of wildfire starts, but how to, was that weather, was that the, the, the curves? Um, that's going to that's going to have to be um, uh, uh, at some point. Uh, if we if we if we want to wait for certainty, we'll be 150, 100 years from now. Uh, at some point, we're just going to have to do an analysis and, and do our best to assess it. Good. Um, any responses to John's comment? Uh, I would just say that's a that's a good point that you make. John, and I think that, uh, you know, one, one example that comes to mind is, you know, you mentioned, you know, tying maybe certain weather events to certain risk events. And obviously we report on those um, through our QDR and all of the quarterly reporting that we do with different risk events and risk drivers. And, um, you know, one of the things that makes it hard to do an analysis based on that data, at least for, for Liberty and, and probably the, the rest of the SMJ uses that um, doesn't, doesn't necessarily decipher between um, fire weather conditions and those risk events. Um, you know, we had the biggest winter in 80 years and uh, obviously there were some reliability issues and some risk events that were associated with that, but there was no fire risk at all. Um, and so, finding a way in the future to maybe tailor it more towards the risk events that happen during, you know, fire weather conditions or fire weather related events might be um, something to explore. And then you also have the added complexity of, say you put in covered conductor and then you have to do a PSPS event because the source is uncovered. And so you now, you know, what's doing the fire mitigation? Is it the covered conductor? Was it the, you know, how much of the covered conductor does it uh, contribute to mitigation or was it the PSPS of it? Yeah, it's mm -hmm. daunting challenge. Thanks, Elliot. And so I, um, <clears throat> I know the IOUs have done some work essentially removing those winter storm events from their data sets when they do their modeling. And I'm sure it's, extra challenging for smaller utilities because there just isn't that much data to start, you know, kind of eliminating and putting filters on that data. Um, is that an option you guys have looked at or is really part of that um, outage rate to wind uh, speed? Is it is it correlated with winter events? Is that something that you're seeing? Uh, the uh, the analysis we did about uh, with you know wind speeds and outage rates was specific to um, fire weather conditions or or you know summer operating period. So that particular analysis was done in that way. And and you know as far as the reporting that we do quarterly, we're just we aren't necessarily pulling that out. We're trying to you know report what's asked for. And um, but I think in, we have discussed. You know, maybe for our modeling purposes, trying to find a way to to, to decipher those different events, and um, I think there's ways to do it. I think we probably have the capabilities of doing it, but um, we haven't got there yet. Thanks, Elliot. Where we record uh, an outage, we also record the environmental conditions of that outage, uh, including like the NFRDS, the fire risk for that day. Uh, and we also do uh, an evaluation on whether that was a, a near miss event, uh, ignition near miss event. Uh, so, you know, you might have like a vegetation outage and it was on a, uh, a dry day. So, but the wind was low, but still it's an ignition the high risk, you know, near miss. Uh, may not have resulted in a wildfire because the wind wasn't there. Uh, but you still, uh, we try to, so, so when we do go back and look at our outages, we do have a way to sort and filter out those winter storm events that were low risk. Good. And just checking on time, we're about uh, 10 minutes away from uh, the end of the session. Does anyone have any other comments or questions on what we just heard? I just want to add a um, kind of a thought here and a comment. Um, so, you know, while we know the models do have patchiness, they might have pixels that are kind of out of whack from other pixels around them in terms of 
um, you know, consequence or probability of ignition risk. Um, and, you know, they have errors. We know that there are errors involved in those modeling outputs, but it, it does seem like the SMJUs are in a very interesting position with being smaller utilities that um, they don't have so much vast space as the IOUs getting identified by these risk models that you can't have, you know, your subject matter experts come in and really focus on and look at those different circuits and do a, a really nice job of essentially connecting those risk model outputs with um, a really granular SME assessment of what's needed. And so it does seem like um, that's happening. And so that's been really great to hear in this session. Thank you. Good. Um, any other comments, questions? Okay, hearing none, I guess we'll give this back to Jessica Mappel. Great, thank you, Louise. Um, and thank you so much, everyone, so far for the presentations and for uh, the engaging questions and discussion. Um, as a reminder, we will have an open Q&A session at the end of the day, during which we'll take um, questions related to all sessions and presentations. So if there are any remaining questions, for instance, on risk assessment um, that folks didn't get the chance to ask, you'll have the opportunity to ask these during that open Q&A session. Um, with that, we'll now break just a little bit early for lunch, and we'll return back at 1 p.m. for the grid operations design and maintenance session. Um, so have a great lunch break, everyone, and we'll see you all back here at 1.
Hello, welcome back everyone. I hope everyone enjoyed their lunch break. Um, I see we're at one o'clock. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started with our next session here. Let me just make sure we have folks for the next session on the line. Yep. Looks like we're all here. Um, so I will go ahead and hand it over to Andy Biggs for our next session covering grid operations, design, and maintenance. Take it away, Andy. Hi, thank you, Jessica. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Andy Biggs. I'm a utilities engineer with Energy Safety, and I'll be moderating this afternoon's panel on grid operation, design, and maintenance. This section covers uh, starting off with uh, grid hardening mitigation used by utilities to reduce wildfire risk, which includes undergrounding and covered conductor installation, as well as traditional hardening and a slew of other things. These mitigations are the utility's main venue for permanent solutions to reduce or eliminate wildfire risk and ensuring that mitigations are tailored to the ignition risk present in a given area. As they discussed uh, in this morning's panel, talking about location specific risks. The section also covers how utilities maintain their assets, consisting of various wildfire risk specific inspections being performed. Asset management is vital for utilities to understand and maintain their equipment health and therefore reduce the risk of equipment failures. Lastly, this section also covers the utilities various operational protocols, such as um, changing the sensitivity settings on protective devices, which encompass encompasses class curve settings and enhanced power line safety settings or EPSS as examples. These settings allow utilities to quickly deploy measures to reduce ignition risk while planning more permanent hardening solutions in the future. And with that, we'll start off with Tom Chow with Bear Valley. Um, hi, can you guys hear me? I wanna make sure. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Hi, I'm Tom Chow, Utility Engineers and Wildfire Mitigation Supervisor. Um, next slide, please. Um, I'm not sure if everyone's familiar with our service territory, but um, just a quick overview that we are 30, 30 square square mile in the rural mount, mountain area, approximately 7,000 feet. In the San Bernardino Mountains, we're roughly 80 miles east of Los Angeles. Our entire serve, service territory is in seven, approximately 7,000 feet. So we're restrained to GO95 grade construction. And 98% of our service territory are in the high fire threat uh, tier two district, and only 2% of it is um, in tier three, which is um, our 34 KV line, the Radford line that's being fed from over the mountain on the south side with Edison. We have, we have approximately over 24,500 customers. Uh, BVS does not have any transmission in, in, the, in our service territory. We are sub-transmission at 34 kV and distribution at 4 kV. Um, before we started um, implementing our cover conductor wire, uh, overhead co cover conductor project, we had approximately 211 um, circuit miles throughout the service territory. Since then, we have covered and replaced bare wires in our sub-transmission 12.9 circuit miles of cover wire in our distribution 22 circuit miles of overhead. And we have sub, uh, 13 substations. Um, our supply line is roughly 39 megawatts. Um, and we have a power plant that produces 8.4 megawatt if, if we need to. Next slide, please. So as, as we all know, historically, bare wire was the preferred method of deliver, delivery energy to the customer as, as we progress with all these wildfire that's happening with the, and we were part of the WMP process that, and the climate change is um, changing the dry conditioning in the high fire threat district and vegetation 
um, that um, we started our cover conductor in 2019 and we looked at various different types of cover con conductor, but our main cover conductor that we are using is um, priority wire 39, 394.5 AAC uh, wire, which has a three layer flam resistant um, insulation um, over the, the strand of the conductor. Um, the, the inner layers are semiconductor cross-link polyester, um, and the inner layer is cross-link um, polyester. But the outer layer that we, because of priority wire, they have developed a sunlight flammable resistant um, insulation on the outer layer, which is to prevent UV and also if, if there was a potential lightning strike Basically, it's a kind of has a water base in there, which would eliminate any potential um, fire on the line. So basically, Bear Valley, like other California utility, is moving forward with the program with replacing high high voltage bear conductor um, to mitigate the threat of wildfire ignition possibility of um, potential of 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 uh, vegetation contact or even a wire down. Um, our our projects aim towards our 34 kVs and our 4 kV distribution um, by replacing bare wire with cover wire. As you can see on the photo on the right, the the one on the top is really where there's cover wire, where tree limbs has, has stayed on there. But that's that's not a picture from us. But if you look at the bottom wire, bottom photo where we had installed our priority wire on our on this location and there was a car hit pole which slapped us uh, broke our 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 pole in, in two pieces and Basically, it was still energized at that time, but we end up de-energizing it, de de it when we were fixing, replacing the pole. Uh, next slide, please. So some of the WMP project we have completed so far since the last um, three years, we have installed over 20 weather stations throughout our 30 square mile service territory. There's also 15, 15 HD camera across the whole service territory. Um, we're a small um, service territory. And um, as of right now, that's what we have installed at the moment. Um, and if, if there's potential new locations that's required, we would uh, uh, look into it and possibly install new cameras and we as as and we also upgraded to our, our substation to be um SCADA capability because the last two years we we install our, our fiber optic network uh, backbone for in our service territory and we also install a fall lower uh, localization isolation and service restoration system in our 34 kV sub transmission. And we've been using the uh, fiber network to connect our fiber. And we also have three of our substation on SCADA. In addition that our part of the WMP, we have completed replacement of all our expulsion views um, by end of 2021. Um, over 2,500 current limited current fuse, L fuse are installed in our system. And over 500 uh, electronically programmable fuse are also installed. So we have roughly over 3,000 fuse all, all then replace expulsion fuse with 
those two options. Next slide, please. So our main focus our, on our WMP project is the cover conductor. Um, the last three years, we've been continuing roughly installing 4.3 circuit miles of 34 kV and on the 4 kV, 8.6 circuit mile. Um, as of right within the last quarter, we installed 34. Point nine circuit miles of cover wire between the 34 and four. And we're continuing to do that. Uh, regarding- Two minutes, other, Tom. Two minutes. Oh, okay. Uh, we also have been doing uh, evacuation route hardening. We have evacuation hardening the, our major three routes, primary evacuation route into Big Bear and out of Big Bear. And we're containing 500 poles per year tree attachment removal. We've been doing that um, ever since. We're down to roughly 560 remaining that needs to be replaced. And within the next three years, we are doing switching capacitor bake. Uh, we're upgrading it, connecting to SCADA, and also continuing automation on our uh, substation three per year. And we have in, installed fused uh, fault indicator um, and we're gonna get those online uh, within working on it uh, within the three years. And we have a new online diagnostic system that monitors and sensors and measures and reports where the fault uh, has happened. Next slide please, or, okay, so I, and then we also continue to try to upgrade our substation. We want to tackle Malby and Village and also upgrade our lake subs. And we also have two um, program, energy um, storage program, a battery and a solar that's um, in the progress too. Next slide, please. So regarding to inspection, we, like all utilities, we incorporate the GO95 with the patrol detail intrusive. Um, that's um, done yearly. Patrol details is also done yearly, but in, in sections intrusive, we do roughly 850 poles. We also implemented um, UAV thermal and HD cameras, um, HD um, photo, video as you can see those are two examples of uv and we also do lidar inspection by our contractor we also have third party ground patrol inspection by third party we also follow geo 174 substation inspection and we have our asset management vegetation management inspection enterprise um, software that we use to 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 keep all the data in there and we do a qc qa process of um, we have a program that where we any look all the location being cover conductor um, throughout the year are being expected and we do um, quality assurance um, I apologize, Tom. You've reached you've reached the end of your time, and that's pretty much um, my last slide. Appreciate it. Okay, thank you so much, Tom. Uh, next up, we have Amy McCluskey with Pacific Board. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my, for the record, my name is Amy McCluskey, and I'm the Vice President of Wildfire Safety and Asset Management at Pacific Corp. And we have a few slides prepared today to, um, to provide an update on the grid design operations and maintenance components of our WMP. So next slide, great. Um, in 2022, Pacific Corp completed asset management work per GO95 and GO165 requirements, plus incremental IR inspections. And so what that means for us is that we completed 74,000 detailed and patrol inspections, identified 12,000 conditions from these inspections, corrected around 10,000 conditions, um, 400 of which we would consider fire threat conditions. So those are our level one, level two, what we call priority A and B conditions within the HFTD. 
Uh, in addition to these core programs, uh, Pacific Corp continued performing supplemental IR inspections on all 700 of our overhead transmission miles in uh, California. Uh, this inspection identified 13 incremental conditions. Mainly, um, we found things like jumpers and splices. And the high priority um, items were corrected, and then our medium priority are currently planned for correction. Uh, in 2023, we intend to continue our core programs and supplement the transmission IR inspection program that we've been doing for a few years with a new pilot on distribution. And so for what that means is in 2023, we plan to complete distribution IR inspections on um, the, the miles located within the HFTD, which for us is about 800 miles. Uh, next slide, Andy. In terms of grid hardening, uh, we're continuing implementation of our line rebuild system automation and expulsion fuse replacement programs. There are a few other things that we're doing um, that I believe Bear Valley just mentioned, things like cameras, uh, things like fault indicators. The update we have here is really focused on what we might consider the, the core programs we're, we're continuing to move forward. Um, as part of the expulsion fuse replacement program, we're replacing all expulsion type fuses with non-expulsion type fuses, similar to, I believe, the exercise Bear Valley went through. Uh, this program right now is targeted within the HFTD. Through 2022, we completed over 2,000 changeouts. Um, and in 2023, we plan to complete an incremental 5,000 changeouts. Uh, happy to report as of May 31st, we've completed just over 1,800 of those. So tracking pretty well on plan. Um, and that full program will complete in 2024. Um, and at that point, we will have changed out everything in the HFTD, and then we'll start to look beyond there to see, see what our risk model is telling us about our next bucket of work. Um, to allow for rapid switching and advanced protection and control schemes, uh, we are also installing and upgrading relays and reclosers. Um, through 2022, we completed 113 projects, plan to complete 40 more in 2023. And once again, tracking pretty good on this one so far to date, we've completed 20 of those 40 projects. Uh, this program is a little different than expulsion fuses, so it is system wide. We prioritize the HFTD work first, but this work um, occurs throughout the service territory and really underpins the evolution of uh, implementing what we call elevated fire risk settings or EFR settings, fast trip settings. Um, I know a lot of folks use different terms for that, but these are the core devices that um, while our whole system has the capability for a fast trip setting, these devices give us an additional level of sophistication to those schemes and an additional level of oper operability. Um, and then kind of the final program on the slide we have is the line rebuild program. Uh, to date, we've installed 83 miles of covered conductor, 62 of which were completed last year in 2022. Uh, we're continuing to ramp up and we do have a plan to install an additional 130 miles this year in 2023. Um, as of May 31st, we've completed 33 of those and there are an additional 51 miles under construction. So overall, we, we have activity going on on over 80 miles right now. So that's a significant improvement from previous years. We're happy to report on. Um, and overall, you have, you have one minute. And overall, we're forecasting 2023 to be one of our more productive construction years. Uh, in the remaining of the year, as well as future years, we're looking to continue ramping up construction activities and move as fast as practical by bringing on a strategic contracted partner. You see on the right-hand slide here, uh, right now we're in the final phases of awarding the RFP and we'll begin onboarding um, as soon as we get that buttoned up. Uh, and so I think that concludes our, our update for Pacific Corp. Yeah, thank you so much, Amy. Uh, last we have Blaine Ladd with Liberty. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Blaine Ladd, I'm the Director of Operations for, for Liberty. Uh, for those of you who don't know, we're the uh, electric utility for the California side of the Lake Tahoe area. Um, also go uh, several miles north and south of the basin, um, just under 50,000 customers, um, voltages ranging from 12.5 kV grounded Y up to 120 kV um, sub-transmission. We have 12 substations and we are winter peaking due to uh, the ski resorts in the area. And I'm gonna talk about uh, our grid ops design and maintenance efforts um, last year and also going into uh, this year. Go ahead, next slide, please. 
So in 2022, um, we continued our system hardening efforts. Uh, we completed three planned covered conductor projects. We also uh, completed several pole replacements, part of uh, our GO165 inspections. And uh, we had a bunch of level two poles, I believe. Uh, we replaced nearly 400 last year. Um, of course, we're doing our test and treat pole replacements each year. Um, we test a little over 3,000 poles per year and any poles identified as needing a replacement. We, of course, get those replaced the same year. Um, this winter was obviously a pretty challenging one for us. We had a lot of storm damage and a lot of pole replacements as, as a result of that. And uh, uh, we continue our, our cover conductor. Um, we're also replacing um, explosion fuses and removing uh, tree attachments from the service territory. Um, substation improvements, including um, animal guards and replacing, we're trying to get rid of all of our oil circuit breakers, which uh, create a a flammable hazard, obviously, within the substation. So we've made pretty good progress in getting rid of, of those devices. And then we're always looking for new uh, technologies out there to, to improve system resiliency. Um, going into 23, we're, we're continuing with co some co covered conductor projects, more pole replacements, and uh, um, quite a bit of traditional system hardening, just traditional rebuilds, um, new poles, new conductor, new new hardware, which we feel is a pretty uh, cost efficient way for a uh, uh, quick, um, quick system hardening and uh, not so expensive as covered conductor and undergrounding. And it's, it's a lot easier to, to permit than undergrounding is. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, we have a, a pretty robust effort this year going what we're calling a sensitive relay profile, basically um, what, what everybody's calling fast trips. So this year um, we are piloting two circuits that we, that we started last year with pretty good success. And we're adding 10 more circuits um, to the program this year. Uh, of course, like I said, these are fast trip settings used on the substation breakers and reclosers, the line reclosers out on the line. Um, in addition, we're adding uh, several fault indicators in strategic locations so that uh, when these devices do trip on a fast trip, we can uh, more easily locate the, locate the fault and uh, you know, improve reliability that way. Um, we're in a collaborative research agreement with the University of Nevada, Nevada Reno. They're doing the, the study work for us on these circuits to uh, get the settings right, to uh, not impact um, system reliability as much uh, with, uh, with, with more uh, sort of dialed in settings, I guess, on these circuits. And you have one minute like, left. We feel like this... Uh, may lead to reduce the use of PSPS. It gives us another option to, uh, to look at before we actually have to go into a, a PSPS mode. And uh, since I have a minute, um, I'd like to give a shout out to Elliot Jones, who is gonna be leaving us at the end of this month. He's our, of course, senior manager of wildfire prevention. And he's done a great job, uh, just bang up job getting us to, to this point in our wildfire mitigation plan. So uh, th thanks, Elliot, for everything. And uh, we wish you luck on your future endeavors. So that's it for me. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much, Blaine. Um, with that, we'll go ahead and open up to questions from our panelists. Uh, we only have one for this particular section, Holly Warman from Cal Advocates. Um, and as a reminder, we want to first prioritize the questions from panelists and also want to open it up to panelists from other sessions as well. So John Mater, I see you have your hand up as well. Um, and then after we get through the panelist questions, we'll open it up to the public. Um, and so Holly, did you have a, a question to start us off? 
Uh, sure, thank you. Um, so my name is Holly Werman. I'm a senior utilities engineer with the Public Advocates Office at the PUC. Um, my first question is about system hardening and for all the utilities. So system hardening, uh, particularly covered conductor, is tends to be a fairly expensive and slow program compared to other mitigations. And with um, the all three uh, S and JU co WMP costs are forecast to be higher in this coming cycle than the last one. So my question is, what um, what alternatives have you examined for system hardening, particularly covered conductor, um, as well as supplemental measures that could perhaps uh, reduce or replace the need for covered conductor to to keep those costs down while not um, you know affecting how much risk that you're able to reduce. Um, so that that's for all three. Sure. Thanks. Um, thanks, Holly. I, I can go first for Pacific Corp. Uh, so I, I heard a couple of things in there. The first is the slow part of covered conductor, and then maybe I'll tackle the cost part of the question. So the under the first part, which is they're slow, yeah, absolutely the the grid hardening, the long term capital investment, you know, as the name implies, is long term. Lots of multi year projects. It couldn't go fast enough for us, right? We always want to go faster. Um, generally what we use in lieu of you know being able to move faster in the capital investment are a lot of the operational practices the operational programs we have and and what i mean by that is um you know using situational awareness to understand the the risk of the day if you will or the risk of the week to change the way we work uh, meaning what tools do you take with you how do you plan your work do you restrict the time under which you work do you reduce hot work or the way we operate the system, which is usually when we're talking about things, we call them elevated fire risk settings, but other folks call them fast trip settings, or I think you heard sensitive relay profile. Uh, so we might put those in place um, up into including things like a PSPS. And so we generally say that the things we have in the interim, in the short term to mitigate risk are those operational tools while our long-term investment catches up. And so that's kind of how we manage the, the timeline. On the cost piece, um, in terms of trying to find an alternative that I would say does the same thing, meaning has the same level of long-term mitigation, um, where we're at now, generally covered conductor or underground, depending on where you're at and constructability, those are, are generally the tools we've got in our toolbox. Um, I don't know that we've come up with, at least on a, at a macro scale, a uh, a more cost-effective solution to accomplish the same mitigation. So I don't think we have any um, kind of clear alternatives there, but as far as the timeline issue, we generally rely on operational strategies and operational tools while the hardening projects kept up, catch up. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, uh, this is for Bear Valley. Um, some of the projects we've been doing like evacuation route hardening by installing wire meshes around wood poles. That's kind of um, one of the major um, remedi in immediate remediation that we've been doing the last two, three years. Uh, we are continuing to do that. So those we got we have hardened the primary evacuation route in our service territory. We're working towards the major secondary routes throughout you know, like the small streets and stuff to hardening those um, poles, existing poles initially till we, uh, until we have time to get, get to that location for cover conductor replacement. And part of the hardening project, we also, instead of in installing more wood pole, we're leaning towards lightweight steel poles or composite poles as we, as part of the uh, mitigation and also with the programs that we're trying to get online, SCADA, and replacing switches, uh, build devices, automating substation, and also fall indicators. Once we get all those on online, every year we do a portion of it um, because of the time constraint in this area. Um, that's kind of the ones we are. Um, Serving. The only thing is underground. The cost of underground in our service territory is, could be three to four times as much as 
cover conductor and with the terrains that we have and, and the availability of construction between April to October, we're limited in our construction time because during the winter time we have snow um, in our service territory um, because I don't know if everyone knows this is a ski resort town in the winter time. So there's gonna be out and with the previous with this year's storm that continue almost to end of April, it's cutting our time of construction. So and then you know we're always here um to look to see if there's any um other new technologies or something. And in in addition, uh before I've been I've been with the company over 10 years, but before my time, I know we talked, everyone's been talking about fast curves and stuff. Um, in the Bear, Big Bear Valley, we are fed, our subs transmission line is fed from Edison. So we have to work with Edison in regarding their settings, um, coordination study. And since over 20 years, what we do during the summertime is we put our setting as one trip and our 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 curves and stuff are at the fastest curve as as possible because we have to coordinate with Edison between the R34 and their 34 and then our 4 kV with our 34. So we 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 are already considered as a in fast trip all year. Um, settings and only when the winter time is because there's no weather condition, dry weather condition, we would change the number of trips from one shot to three shot. So in the summertime during because of weather, dry wind, um, dry weather, wind condition, we would make it into a one one trip, but still at the same setting as the winter. Um, curve settings, protective settings, that's what I'm trying to say. So, um, sorry, I got booted off there a minute. Is it, is it my turn to, to go ahead? Uh, yes, please. Okay. Um, so, obviously, yeah, uh, cover conductor is, is pretty expensive. And so we've kind of used it where it makes sense for us in, in some high fire threat areas. Kind of more remote and uh, with with a lot of uh, dead or dying trees. Um, also, undergrounding due to our our service territory is a uh, is pretty pretty difficult uh, with permitting and, and very costly due to the terrain and it's pretty rocky up in the Tavo area. So, um, yeah, we're pretty much looking at uh, everything else out there that's been mentioned. Um, fast trips traditional rebuilds and hardening. We're doing a lot of that this year. We've, um, we're piloting the, the DFA technology. We, uh, we have a DA scheme in place, distribution automation, um, working with Swedish neutral this year for uh, design on one substation to, um, to look at uh, protecting uh, two, two of our transformers. And that would be five, five feeders in our tier three fire threat area, um, HIFD, you know, traditional veg clearing, explosion fuse replacements, um, you name it, we're, we're working on it, so. Okay, thank you. Great, thank you. Um, and then John, did you still have a question? I do. Um... So I want to commend uh, all the uh, work that's being done to um, to replace expulsion fuses. Um, you know, it's one of the it's the low low hanging fruit kind of uh, mitigation um, that uh, you know I, I put into the feedback in just about every welfare mitigation plan that that we review. Um, the other one I I put in is um, re replacing lightning arresters with exempt lightning arresters. Um, and then lately this last year, um, in, in, I've been recommending that operationally that when operating switching equipment, especially SCADA switching equipment, 
that you either have situ you have some sort of situational awareness over that switch when you're operating it, either through remote. And I see the the Bear Valley has got uh, I think it was 15 cameras, but uh, but if there is a switch that is not covered by um, situational awareness intelligence devices, um, getting a Mark One eyeball on it uh, while while you're operating it, that that's you know, it's the, what we're trying to do here is um, lessen or eliminate the generation of sparks. And sometimes equipment doesn't operate correctly. And uh, one of those one of those times is uh, when you're changing the state of the grid uh, through switching. Um, and so that's something that I've been uh, recommending. And so um, it's you know, so when you're especially for Bear Valley, when you're when you're looking at those devices. Uh, do you have an operating procedure where you, where if you have, you mentioned that you're going to be installing more SCADA switches, are, are you making sure that you have some situational awareness of its state when you're changing that? Um, this is Tom. So part of our cover conductor and our switch um, switch uh, automation um, um, and field device automation is as we get to those switch, as in like, for example, the cover conductors and get to that location where there's a switch and that switch has, has issues in the past or it's kind of old or whatever it is, we end up just replacing the switch at that point. And, and part of the switching thing is if we're gonna automate it, we either know that switch is good or if we need to replace it, or it's already been replaced before we automate it, um, put a motor operator switch on and connect it to SCADA. Um, and if we, if there's an existing switch that may have issue that we haven't got to, uh, we may end up, instead of operating that switch, we would go to the next nearest switch that we are more comfortable with it and operating it manually. Um, well, we would... Actually, Tom, what my question uh, in regards to this one, one, I'd, you know, like your, your response to the question about exempt uh, lighting arresters, and two, two is an operating procedure by which you just assume each switch is gonna have a problem. And either you've got a camera on it or you, you, you've got a, a human being observing, because as you automate these switches, you know, you could have a you can have a problem when you energize or de-energize equipment, and um, you may not be you you want to be aware as soon as possible. So that, that that's that's what I was asking. Okay, so you're saying once we automate it, um, I mean we haven't looked into installing camera in that, those locations, but uh, we can. Or, or um, it's a proposal of us maybe having a camera at this location that we're automating it. Um, but at times that when we're automating it, we our our, crew, our crews are out patrolling um, the location, making sure there's no potential ignition, and there's times that they are actually at the switch, and then we operate it through SCADA. And these newer, the switches that we're installing, they are fairly new within the last few years. So, yeah, but we, we if we're going to, and we do maintain them, um, if we're going to do some switching procedure, we're usually um, take a, um, be out there to make sure it's functioning correctly or there's no potential issues when we operate it. But the cameras, um, um, what you're saying is it's a no, good... I'm saying either or, either have a camera on it or make sure that you've got, you're observing the SCADA switch in some we, way, observe yeah. the SCADA switch when you operate it. We will consider um, adding, think, think about the option of cameras also, if we're not out there. And then the lightning arresters? Um, no. I'm pretty, I, I believe all our lighting rest, we don't have a lot of underground dips throughout the valley and anywhere we have 
a dip. We do have lightning restoration. I, I have to double check. I'm pretty sure those are all exempt lightning restor in, in our system. That'd be good to capture in your wildfire mitigation plan so that when it's reviewed, um, you know, because so I always check for the low hanging fr fruit has all been taken care of. How about uh, Liberty and, and Pacifica? Yeah, for Liberty, um, I'll start with lightning arrestors. So to date, we have not replaced um, our traditional lightning arrestors with any uh, non-explosion arresters. Uh, we just brought in some samples to start to start looking at that and changing our, we'll have to change our standards, um, our standard construction practices in order to get those on there. As you probably know, they're, they're a little bit larger than your traditional arresters, so it's going to take some adjustments. Uh, we are starting to, to look at those. Um, and then as far as uh, SCADA switching, um, we only have two uh, traditional air switches that are SCADA controlled, and to be honest, like you said, they don't they don't operate well. So we almost always have people out there anyway to operate them. And the rest of our SCADA operated equipment is uh, either a line recloser, so vacuum vacuum recloser, or your substation breakers. So um, all of our uh, yeah, traditional air switches are manually operated, so you'd have boots on the ground to operate them anyway. Right. Thank you. And for um, Pacific Corp, the on the lightning arrestor question, so, and we're not always very, I guess we're not very explicit in our plan, uh, our expulsion fuse replacement program also includes lightning arresters. We, we consider it, you know, changing out all kind of over voltage over current devices. So that's the idea is just to kind of get it all up to speed as you go down the circuit. Um, so it does include that. And then in terms of kind of eyes on switches, um, it, it does sound very similar to Liberty where the Kind of remote switching we have is either reclosers, which are those encapsulated vacuum mm -hmm. style, or we're talking about substation breakers. Um, any other style would be manual, so you'd have have someone physically there. Um, and in general, uh, one of the ways we manage kind of risk with situational awareness is if we're in those higher risk scenarios, we are patrolling before we re-energize. So um, that is that is an element that also sounds similar, I think, to what Bear Valley was mentioning. Thank you. That's the end of my questions. Okay. Thank you, John. Uh, Holly, did you have any more questions? Uh, yes. So, uh, one of the other questions I had was about detailed inspections. So, uh, detailed inspections are, at least in my review, typically where you find the most you know, fire risk uh, issues because you're getting eyes, close eyes on equipment. Um, as far as I, I, so I know some of the utilities perform detailed inspections more frequently in the HFTDs, while some perform them at just the GO 165 minimum of five years. So my question is, um, have you considered a more risk-focused approach on detailed inspections, increasing them in either the HFTDs or in areas where your uh, risk models you know, identify the highest risk circuits? Um, if so, could you please discuss that, uh, your plans? And if not, uh, could you discuss why not? Um, I can go first for Pacific Corp. Um, in terms of programmatically, I would say no, not yet might be the correct answer. We haven't yet uh, gone to more uh, frequent detailed inspections. What we do have is during those uh, kind of periods of high risk where maybe our five-day forecast or even our monthly forecast indicates we might have risk in some areas that maybe haven't been, you know, assigned that five-year cycle, uh, we tend to perform additional patrols. It's not detailed inspection. It is more the patrol style inspection. It's not a program, meaning there's not a, a work plan developed at the beginning, beginning, uh, beginning of the year that's fixed. It is very risk-based as the risk is occurring almost. So we do those additional ones, but once again, not programmatic. Where I think we've deviated from the, the compliance elements of the general orders uh, we've, is where we've have supplemental IR inspections. So that's really been the biggest shift for us is less around the cycle, more around the technology. 
Yeah, uh, this is Tom from Fair Valley. So detail inspection, um, I, I, we do more than um, based on the five year cycle. Um, in addition to that, for example, like during the high fire season, um, if it's really, we haven't had rain for a while and it seems like it's really dry, um, we, we would, um, have additional um, inspections going out there to survey the line. And also like what Paul was mentioning regarding the Techno Silva, if they, uh, based on the, their modeling, if they like, for example, in the Fox, Fox, Fonskin area, we, we would have someone go out there and check out that location of the line. And in, in part of that, we also have, we do the, UAV um, third party inspection, just um, additional inspection that's, that's going on throughout the year. All right, can I ask a clarifying question? Um, you said that you do perform extra detailed inspections uh, based either on risk or if the, situ if the environment is drier. Um, is that something that you have been doing or are planning to do? Because I, I don't recall seeing that in uh, in your WMP. Well, we, we we may not have put it in there, but if we noticed that, like last year, there was a certain amount of time, there was a, a drier month. Um, and then we were, based on um, Paul's, Paul was looking at it too, so he was instructing, "Hey, let's have let's do some more patrols." Um, and this year, it looks like our target we're doing basically half of our valley instead of a, a one fifth of the valley for of detail inspection. Okay, thank you. And for uh, Liberty. Um, Short answer is yes, we have considered it. Uh, we haven't implemented it, but we have considered it, especially in our, our tier three uh, fire threat areas. Um, having said that, um, we, we have resource constraints. Um, we've had to bring in contract resource or contract inspectors just to, just to stay compliant with GO165 at this point. But with the amount of capital work that we're doing um, we're pretty much, we've got crews out, um, eyes on uh, roughly 30% of our system just this year alone with the amount of work that we're doing. So we, we feel pretty good about that. They, they know to, uh, if they see something, say something, and we'll get out there and correct any uh, serious infractions um, right away. Also, we've had some close calls with, with PSPS a few times. And we've always gone out and done proactive patrols in the areas where uh, it looks like we might have to implement PSPS. We haven't had to yet, knock on wood, but uh, the areas that we thought we were going to have to, we, we did proactive patrols before. So. Uh, okay, thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, wanted to check to see if any of our other Panelists, had any questions? Not seeing any hands raised. Uh, Holly, did you have any more? Uh, yes. So I'm. I do see a question from Charles in the Q and A that I am also interested in the answer to. But prior to that. Um, You've all mentioned uh, fast trip settings, either pilots or something that you've used in the past. Could you go into a little more detail on these? Um, for example, are these manufacturer presets? Are these customized settings? Um, and then, you know, just generally a, a brief description of, for example, is it a certain percentage over peak or average load for a certain amount of time to de-energize the um, in the fast trip condition? Um, I I'd just like a little more context around how you operate your fast trip uh, settings. 
Sure, um, I can go go for Pacific Corp. Um, so, with uh, with our fast trip settings, we call them EFR settings, elevated fire risk, and so there we're in. I I think this would be maybe our year two and a half. So I think a few years ago, we started understanding, learning, had them in place last year, and, and now we are continuing to use them. And what it, uh, I would say the true technical pieces aside, the way it practically functions is if you take a standard circuit, you might have you know, a substation circuit breaker, a recloser out on the line, and let's say, let's pretend we're at the very end of a nominal couple mile circuit. Um, something might contact the line by the time the different sort of schemes coordinate and talk to each other, it may, it, it could maybe take five, six, seven seconds, we'll say, um, to fully isolate that potential contact. Uh, when you go to something like an EFR setting, it, the goal is to detect as many things as we can and isolate as fast as we can. So that exact same scenario is generally targeted for less than a second. And so it's it's really around eliminating the potential exposure and the potential energy that can re be released during that um, that scenario. Um, and I think uh, depending on what uh, the reason I stay away from some of the technical things is um, every device is a little bit different. Every make and model is a little bit different. They are uh, they come with the capability. So depending on what device you've installed, it has certain capabilities. It's programmable. It does not come built in with it. You know, it's not a, it's not like you go to the store and you buy, I'll, I'll take the EFR device or the non-EFR device. So they very much are developed by our internal protection and control engineering departments. They do bench testing, collaborate with other utilities. So it's a pretty complicated technical process that I would say is, is evolving constantly. Um, and, and so we're now in our second year of doing that. And so I'm hoping that answers the question, Holly, on what you were trying to get at. If we need more technical, technical information, I can certainly get that from the team. Okay, I, I think that um, that generally describes what I'm looking for. If, if we need more technical info, we can, um, we'll send a data request. So, thank you. Um, for Bear Valley, I, I did kind of, briefly went through because of Edison. Um, we have to be a slightly faster settings than them. And most uh, our set all of our settings are overturn settings and ground trip settings. Um, and then for the expulsion fuse that we replaced with uh, electronic fuse, those were set as senator overcurrent settings at what they were currently at. For example, they were um, fuse, whatever the, the K fuse or whatever it was, we set it at the same type of fusing um, speed as that. And part of that, it, it was, it would coordinate with our substage setting, which is our overcurrent and ground trip settings and Regarding to Edison, because like, for example, our Raptor line, it, it goes through the tier three, four service that's also connect Ed, Edison's in that area too. Their ground settings, is, for example, is at 12 amps. And we have to set at 10. So if there's a difference in between the phase amperage of 10, it would trip. So we're, we're we have to be more sensitive than they would, um, because we don't want to trip them. We want to trip us uh, based on the coordination study as part of the study. Um, so we are faster trip than they are. And is that coordination? Oh, sorry to cut you off, Blaine. Um, it's another oh, question no for Bear Valley. Is that coordination uh, study something that would be available to, to uh, if we re it? Uh, we have some of it. Some okay. of the work, yeah. Um, my other question is um, Edison, I believe, has, they have their ordinary settings. They also have particular fast trip settings that they enable during times of uh, elevated fire risk. So, not for the whole season, but kind of as situation uh, you know, demands it. In those cases, is Bear Valley still set to? trip before Edison? Does Edison alert you when they're enabling their fast trip settings? 
How do, how do you coordinate under those conditions? Um, um, because I'm not part of operations, so let's say there is a PS PS event, not on our side, because most of the time in our side, if if there is a PS PS, it's usually because of Edison, they would um the wind speed and it's different than because we have we're we're kind of with the Santana winds, we're kind of in the middle away from it. So we don't actually get the high winds of San, Santana winds from downhill. Um, we are in um, contact, but I'm, I'm, um, may, I'm not sure if the location that they have fast setting is, is for our area. If um, that is the case, we definitely need a kind of look into that, but then see what their setting is. And I was not uh, aware that they were doing that in our area. Okay. Um, okay thank you. Uh, and uh, Liberty. Yeah, for us, um, so initially we were just using traditional hot lag tag settings, which are uh, really for personnel protection and not necessarily for this escalated fire risk. Um, that's why we uh, are collaborating with, with the University of Nevada to really understand the circuits, study them, look at the loads and come up with uh, settings which um, use uh, both a fast curve and instantaneous um, com combination, and that that better uh, coordinates with um, you know downstream devices and and helps to sort of alleviate some of the the nuisance tripping that can cause um, you know reliability type of issues. Um, so yeah, that's that's kind of where we're at with our our. So we're kind of methodically looking at each circuit studying it and make, making sure we're getting the settings dialed in as as best we can. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Holly. Um, yeah, I wanted to go ahead and ask the written Q&A question from Charles Madison. Um, first part, how do you currently approach the inspection and maintenance of covered conductors and how do these procedures, per practices align with your standard inspection procedures? And then what strategies do you have in place to assess and monitor the condition and expected lifespan of cover conductors within your system? Um, I'll go first, Andy. So for Pacific Corp on the first question, approaching inspe inspection and maintenance of covered conductors, uh, we're leveraging our other inspection programs. So whether it's detailed inspections, whether it's patrol inspections, uh, IR inspections, we're leveraging the same programs um, to inspect covered conductor, just like we would um, a bare conductor. What we've done is we've changed, I would say the list of everything our inspectors are looking for. And so the scope, if you will, of the inspection has been modified to make sure it includes covered conductor, um, making sure we have a way to record things that we find with covered conductors. So we have we have condition codes set up in our system similar to uh, they would mimic kind of corrective maintenance orders or tags. Um, other companies use different phrases. And so we have uh, something set up so that you can see if you have any outstanding conditions on covered conductor and pull them and, and work the corrective action. So we've just embedded it into our programs. And as far as the kind of forward looking assessment and monitoring the condition and expected lifespan. Um, I don't know that we have anything, I would say, different, more sophisticated than just our, our standard maintenance and, and asset replacement programs. So I don't think there's anything different there. Um, we are starting to look into new technologies, I will say, that just give us insight into how the system's operating in general. I think Bear Valley touched on quite a few of them in their presentation. Um, things like uh, trying to anticipate the faults, so DFA, there's some technology there. Um, I, I think that's probably where we're moving the most forward in terms of trying to monitor the condition. Um, we just don't, we're not quite there yet. We have a few devices installed, haven't, you know, really collected enough, enough data to come up with a meaningful conclusion yet. 
Um, for Bear Valley, uh, based on uh, inspection maintenance. Um, so as the cover conductor gets installed, we, our inspector would go out and inspect the portion that has been installed. Cover conductor on our end, it just been started for the last four years. We're still fairly in the early stage of it. And um, I believe the manufacturer has a roughly, let me don't quote, quote me, it was, it was like 20 plus year life, life, lifespan of it. So I kind of have to look, um, double check on that. But as we do those inspections, um, every year, detail, patrol, UAV, because a part, part of the patrol and UAV and third party, and those are done throughout the whole BBS service, service territory. Um, it pretty much covers um, looking at the cover conductor also in part of the inspection. And for Liberty, um, yeah, similar to the others, we've kind of folded in the cover conductor with our traditional detailed and uh, patrol inspections. So, um, yeah, nothing special there for, for the covered. Uh, we are trying to, uh, well, we are going to be folding in um, uh, manufacturer recommendations for, for what they want, want us to look for during these inspections. We haven't yet, but that, that's coming to enhance our, our inspection program. And then as far as um, monitoring the condition, yeah, um, like Amy mentioned, we've got uh, some DFA uh, technology, some other technologies um, to, to sort of monitor that, that kind of stuff hopefully going forward. But we're very interested to see the lifespan of this as well. And we'll be keeping a close eye on the, the integrity of that, that covering to make sure it's not deteriorating, you know, under UV or, or, uh, or weather, um, uh, similar to like some of the secondary wire, uh, we call it gray wire. We have a program to replace that up here where the, 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 the covering is actually getting pretty brittle and starting to, to fall apart. So we'll, we'll be watching for, for that kind of stuff on this covered conductor. Great. Thank you so much. Um, so you had a question? And then also a reminder for um, any attendees or panelists, if you're interested in asking a question, feel free to either use the raise your hand function or type in a question in Q&A. But um, yeah, for now, I'm Zoe. Yeah, thanks, Andy. Um, my, I have a question for Liberty. Um, so my understanding is that a lot of the energy deliveries come from NV Energy in Nevada, and they enacted their PSOMs, PSOMs, which are like PSPS in California. And so my question is kind of around um, how is Liberty working with NV Energy to coordinate hardening to um, prevent any interruptions from maybe um, these PSPS type activity that NV Energy might be enacting? Um, yeah, we, we communicate pretty closely with, with NV Energy, with their control center. I think you're muted, Blaine. So, so sorry. Um, I was talking away there. Um, yeah, we, we regularly meet with NV Energy. Um, we, uh, we meet with their wildfire specialists and weather specialists and, and discuss the areas where they're what they're hardening and uh, I know they're doing a lot of a lot of work on some of the transmission that that does feed us um, of course we're at the at the mercy of their peace peace on events um, unfortunately but we do see that they are making efforts to to sort of improve their their systems that that feed us so we're we're happy happy to see that and um yeah, I think, does that sort of answer your question or? It, is there it does, yeah, thanks, Blaine. And so there's no, I mean, I guess they're kind of doing their own hardening process, but there is communication between um, the two sides for how to kind of mesh all of that together with the exchange. Yeah, that's correct. I mean, okay. we, 
we do kind of try to be a squeaky wheel once you know <laughs> sure. they uh they they respond to us but uh, they you know they have their their own priorities too great thank you okay thank you uh holly did you have any more questions um no, i think most of my questions have been answered uh either directly or tangentially oh sorry did you have another question yeah, I can ask another question. Um, again, this is for Liberty. So looking at your um, grid hardening plans on the maps that you've provided in the WMPs, there's a section of um, circuits or circuit segments in the Walker area listed as very high risk. And the mitigations proposed there are traditional hardening, not covered conductor. And so my question is, if you can talk a little bit about the local conditions there and what is that decision making process that goes into determining whether you're going the traditional hardening route versus the covered conductor route. Yeah, I think um, I think it's really just um, the the efficiency of a traditional um, a traditional hardening project. So so down there we had some some pretty small wire that that was failing on us and we really just wanted to get that out of the system as quick as possible um, and with you know uh, i guess minimal design effort and so the decision was made to go ahead and just do a, a traditional rebuild on some of the on some of the laterals so basically the the main line down there, um, a lot of it is is covered. We did go with covered conductor, but in order to um, to more rapidly get rid of that that um, that smaller wire that we were really really concerned that it was going to going to cause problems and ignitions down the road, we wanted to uh, uh, more rapidly get that that out of there. So, and uh, you know, traditional hardening is is still uh, a viable option, I think. Perfect, thanks for that. Great, thank you. Um, and then I actually had a question. Um, I know both Liberty and Pacific Aura kind of briefly mentioned DFA, but I was just sort of curious um, from all the utilities about what sort of technologies you're working on piloting right now. Um, and also recognize that like SMJs are a lot smaller than the IOUs and the IOUs kind of have the forefront of doing a lot of this piloting. So I was curious about what sort of coordination you've had with them to kind of like, are you holding off and seeing what pilots work on their end before implementing them? Which pilots have you been watching on their side? And then how do you decide to actually take a, a pilot and, and implement it yourselves? Um, I think I go oh, first. Oh. For for Liberty, I think um, we're kind of at the point right now where we're looking at anything and everything, but we definitely are watching the big three, which is is why um, we put an emphasis on the, the SRP or fast trip program, because I know that um, especially San Diego has reported a lot of, of success with that program. Um, so certainly we're, we're definitely watching those guys to see and we we meet with them also with their experts to uh, listen and hear you know what what's working um, hence the fact that we're we're moving forward with a uh, with the Swedish neutral um, I think uh, SCE has reported some good success with that um, DFA we've uh, we've already piloted so we're going to kind of make our own call on that I think some of the big three are are might be pulling away from that i'm not sure but and then distribution automation piloting um yeah so kind of a um everything but uh right now uh, an emphasis on on fast trips because of uh, the reported success of that program um, and for Bear Valley, uh, I mentioned that we are piloting our online diagnostics system. Um, 
this year. It was supposed to happen last year, but um, due to uh, manufacturer material issues that that didn't, didn't happen. That's the main reason. And then we are looking to see what the I, three IOUs um, come up with, and we could, on our end, discuss if that's the right approach for us or not, and then go from there. And um, at for Pacific Corp, I think it's very, very similar. And so kind of the, the first bucket of things are things like DFA um, or rapid earth fault current limiters. I think it's REFCL. I, that one always trips me up a little bit, the acronym there, uh, where, you know, the idea is we have maybe these devices or additional technology to kind of predict what's happening or get a better sense of something before it happens. And so we do have some small projects in California, I think is just DFA only, the broader company. I know we have a, a team looking into the some of the other devices. Kind of the second bucket of things that we're trying out, and it's very much based on lessons learned from some of the large I use, is just how to use different settings or program things differently or fully use the features of the devices we have. And examples would be uh, high impedance fault detection. So inherent to our elevated fire risk settings is high impedance fault detection. So when we turn those on, we're essentially turning on high impedance fault detection. And then right now, and it's still, I would say very much in test phase, brainstorm phase is, is falling conductor and broken conductor features. I think that that is something that's a little bit newer out there is how do you even get more out of your protection and control schemes to to detect these these more very unique circumstances. Um, and in general, Andy, I think your, your general question was like, how do you know what to do or how do you know to do a pilot or when does it become a real program? And for the most part, we're just learning from some of the other utilities, you know, working with you know, through industry consortiums and things like that. And it's, it's sometimes it's about kind of trying it out, proving the concept and then figuring out how to grow the program. Okay, thank you. Um, so you had another question? I just had a follow up on that. I'm really curious. I understand these are, you know, in the pilot stage. And so some of the things we've been hearing with REFCL is not having space or the grid not really being designed to, you know, handle the technology and that's you know, the broad lay version of it. Um, but I was wondering if you could fill in a little bit on your internal assessments and what kind of barriers you guys are running into with that if there's space issues or um, kind of setup issues. Um, yeah, I think... I'm not sure if I've heard it described just as that, but I do know I've, I've heard the, it takes a lot of space in the substation, it takes a lot of space in the facilities. Um, I don't know that we've done enough kind of construction mapping or detailed planning to say, oh, and here's the constraint that we've run into. Um, I think we're still in initial talks with the, the supplier of the equipment. Um, I do think, I think we've heard, I think it's SCE maybe had some issues with space, trying to get things to fit in. Um, I don't know that we're in a different spot. I just don't know that we've learned anything new or, or beyond what they've learned yet. <laughs> but yeah, space is definitely, definitely an issue. Yeah, for, for Liberty, I would say space and, and cost because REFCL is, is not cheap. So, but, you know, having said that, we, We've we've heard from the other utilities that it's a successful technology, especially on a three wire system, which which we have at at Tahoe. It's uh, it, it's almost I think really designed for for three wire. So um, yeah, the 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 sub that we're piloting this at does have quite a bit of room, so it's not 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 an issue. So um, yeah, so. Certainly, if there's space constraints, um, we're looking at the other uh, the other technologies, right? Your fast trips, DFA things, things like that, HIFD. Um, so whatever whatever tools in the bucket sort of makes sense for that particular area, I guess. Thanks, Blaine. And Amy, is your system mostly three wire? Are there any kind of like you know technical limitations with the three versus four wire? Um, I know we have both, uh, both three wire and single wire and, and four wire. Um, I think we have almost all configurations. Um, I'm not sure uh, 
specific to um, kind of some of the technology, you know, whether or not we're running into hurdles with that, um, but we definitely do have, have a variety. Thanks everyone. Great, thank you. Um, then I had another question. Um, I know we talked a little bit about how you're, or some of you are using um, LiDAR and infrared for inspections. I was curious if you've looked into using drones at all or using any sort of aerial inspections. Um, yeah, and, oh, actually, I'll wait. <laughs> was that, was that Blaine, was that you? Or nope, Tom? No, this is Tom. Yeah, part of our, uh, we've been, sorry, interrupt, Amy. Uh, we, we've been having our third party um, contractor doing our UAV LIDAR the last two years. So it's been going on for us. Um, so for Pacific Corp, a, a couple of different things we've done. We've had contracted drone inspections. Um, we also have some internal pilots. We've primarily used it as a reactive tool to go follow up, to learn more, to dig deeper. Um, we're currently right now looking to move forward a pilot in, in California, hopefully later this year. It's it, Right now, we're, we're just trying to figure out resource constraints. How do we, how do we get a contractor on board uh, to start looking at drone inspections? Um, not sure yet exactly what the scope is, but it is something we're trying to move forward this year just to learn a little bit. It seems like I've seen mixed results in the different large you know, large utility WMPs, some seem to be in favor, some seem to be phasing it out. And so I think we're gonna, we're gonna experiment a little bit and see if, if it gives us any more information. Yeah, and for Liberty, for drones specifically, we do have two internal um, drone pilots. So uh, we haven't used it too much, except for uh, some, some reactive things where um, we're just trying to get uh, eyes on the system real quick. Like, like a, a pre-patrol for a PSPS, for instance, um, but with the limitations of, of drones and, you know, their their uh, their range and things like that, we haven't used it uh, uh, quite as much as uh, as as like LIDAR, which uh, we're pretty pretty excited about. We've, we've used LIDAR for a couple of years now for VEG, and we're we're uh, uh, pretty excited to move, move that into the uh, asset management realm too. Great, thank you. Sorry, did you have a, another question? Just a couple follow-ups on that. Um, Tom, did you have you guys noticed in your drone and your aerial program if those inspections find basically issues that are not found in the detailed inspections? Are they are they different or are you kind of finding the same things or what's your what's your results there? Um well it's well, regarding the detail, um, we're just looking from the ground up, but because of the drone, you, you can see more when you're up in the air from the top up. Um, it does, it does has help us to evaluate what they, their findings and revisit those location to see if we actually had an issue on there. I, I believe um, the first time we did it, there was actually a, what's it called, a little infra, um, hot spot, and we, and we ended up fixing that hot spot. Um, so it does, it's another pers perspective of the inspection. It does help. So you found it to be kind of like complementary to the other methods you're currently using? Yes. Standard methods. And then Blaine, I had a follow-up question. Um, we've heard that there are sometimes data challenges with the LIDAR data collection. So you'll just get, I mean, it's a point cloud and it's massive amounts of data. Have you guys run into any challenges with um, data processing speed to use that LIDAR data in a timely fashion? Um, I, I think a little bit, I would, 
I'd probably defer that to to our veg team more because they've they've been the ones that have uh, that have sort of um, piloted that project. And um, yeah, uh, Peter's texted me. He said no, they haven't really had any challenges with the with the data. So yeah, okay, phone you. a friend. <laughs> And Paul, did you have a comment or add? Yeah, I, I just want to add something. So we do the thermography um, with an aerial device and uh, and photography and videography, and then the lidar is both truck mounted and UAV. But another, a couple of things that these inspections do is you can cross check and a do some quality checks uh, between the different inspection methodologies. Uh, it also, these electronic tests, the LIDAR, the UAV, and so forth, each year give you some, uh, I would say, objective quality evidence, too, on how well, on what you've done for your line clearance, uh, so that if something were to happen, you can go back and help with the investigation, too. Uh, so I think that's an important aspect. And then one of the things that we found with the UAV uh, photography and videography, it actually feeds into the asset planning maintenance because you got really high quality pictures and video of every pole and asset out there. So before you, the linemen go out on a job site, they can actually uh, take a look at what's on that pole, see the environment there. So it's got a lot of other uses just besides the inspection, you know, lo looking for a deficiency. Uh, so yeah, I think those aspects sometimes are lost, but uh, we've found using these tools are, are tend to be more valuable than just inspection. Okay, thank you so much, Paul. Um, yeah, and, and thank you so much to our panelists for the questions and for the utilities for representing. I know it's a broad, Topic, so there was lots of coverage. So really appreciate it. Um, I think with that, I'll hand it back to Jessica. Great, thank you so much, Andy, and thank you to all of our utility representatives for the presentations and to our panelists for the continued discussion. Um, we'll now just take a quick ten-minute break, and we'll be back here at about two thirty-three for the next session on vegetation management.
Hello, welcome back everyone. Hope everyone had a nice quick break. Uh, it's 2.32, so we'll go ahead and get started with the next session covering vegetation management, and I'll hand it off to Colin Lang, who will be the session moderator. Awesome, thank you so much, Jessica. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Colin Lang. I am a senior environmental scientist with Energy Safety, and I will be moderating today's vegetation management panel. Vegetation management can reduce both wildfire ignition and consequence risk. It involves planning for both the canopy surrounding overhead lines and the understory in and around the right of way. Landscape structures modified by colonization and our changing climate have made vegetation management efforts challenging and require land managers and utilities to constantly adjust to the, pres to the present, sometimes unprecedented conditions. Since the inception of the wildfire mitigation plans, utilities have increased the scale and scope of their vegetation management programs to address contact with vegetation, a significant driver of utility wildfire risk. First, we will hear a presentation from Liberty, who is represented by Peter Stoltman. Then we will hear from Bear Valley, represented by Jared Henneman. And finally, Pacificor, represented by Brian King. Um, these presentations, uh, like this morning, will be followed by a panel discussion. This panel includes Henry Sweat of the CPUC's Safety Policy Division and Greg Morris of the Green Power Institute. Um, as always, um, during this panel discussion, um, other attendees will be able to ask questions of utility representatives, and you may raise your hand to speak, and we will unmute you in order of raised hands or you may use the Zoom's Q&A function and we will read your question out loud for the group. Um, so without further ado, Peter, please take it away. And you have uh, 10 minutes. Okay, thank you, Colin. Can you all hear me all right? Yes, we can. All right, great. Uh, so as Colin mentioned, my name is Peter Stoltman. I'm the manager of vegetation management for Liberty. And on the first slide, um, we'll provide really a uh, kind of an overview of the whole program, you know, in our approach to vegetation management. So we implement three different inspection protocols and have, you know, corresponding maintenance that relates to those uh, different protocols. And so, um, you know, this is what's considered a defense in depth strategy, whereas if one of the uh, mitigation activities or strategies fail, the uh, idea is that one of the uh, overlapping um, programs will catch any of those misses uh, during the inspections or maintenance. So we have remote sensing inspections. That's a, a full uh, LIDAR survey of our system that we perform annually. The primary purpose of that is to uh, maintain our clearances from vegetation to conductors and make sure that we are uh, maintaining those clearances throughout the year. We also perform detailed inspections where we have uh, arborists patrol uh, the lines. They look for really anything that could be a problem. The main, the main purpose is looking for hazard trees, you know, uh, along our power lines and creating work orders to, to mitigate those hazards. And we have uh, patrol inspections, which are a quicker uh, patrol of those lines, primarily looking for dead and dying trees. We you know, have seen a lot of mortality on our system. It uh, continues to, to occur year, year over year. And so uh, those patrol inspections have been helpful to, to continue to address the issue of tree mortality throughout the system. We also perform post-work verification, uh, quality control inspections of both the inspections and the maintenance activities, and also um, work closely with agency partners uh, in, you know, roughly speaking, close to half of our system occurs on public land, either federal or state land. And so we're uh, very cognizant of the potential you know, impacts to the environment while we're doing that work. So we have uh, specific processes and procedures in place to, uh, you know, pr protect the, uh, the resources in which we're working. 
And we really try to implement a philosophy where, you know, vegetation management, I think historically has been seen as something that, um, you know, has a negative impact on, on the environment and our approach is to operate uh, our program in a manner that really can produce a net benefit both in wildfire mitigation, but also things like ecosystem services, um, you know, maintaining the uh, environment for stormwater runoff, which is a, a big concern here in the Lake Tahoe Basin, and also protecting the cultural resources from, from the, uh, the people that re were here before us. We've also really expanded our community outreach program. So we'll, you know, do the traditional notification uh, procedures, you know, with going door to door when we're inspecting and creating work orders. We've also created different uh, mailer distributions, you know, in the form of postcards that we'll send out sometimes in advance of work that's going to be occurring. We work really closely with our communications department to send out social media um, announcements, uh, billing inserts, emails to our customers when we have things that are occurring that will uh, affect the customers that we serve and also to provide them information about some uh, services that we provide. Last year, we uh, started doing a tree giveaway. So it's really shrubs, compatible plants on the system where customers can order and pick up from a, uh, a local nursery uh, plant material that they could plant in their yard that will be compatible with our system as far as not being mature heights that would uh, conflict with the power lines, but also native plants that are appropriate for our, for our environment. That's a, a brief overview. You know, over the last six years, we've really uh, increased the volume of work that we're, we've been doing, you know, really starting in 2019 when uh, wildfire mitigation plans were first being formulated and have continued a steady increase uh, over that time period. You can see in that six year period, we've done uh, increased our volume an average of 35% year over year, um, which has been, it's been a, a lot of work, but we've been able to implement this in a way where we also have put in place processes and, and the way that we do the work in order to um, get that more get that work done and also get it done more timely, you know the that 58% decrease in duration is the time from when a work order is created to when the crews are actually completing that work. So not only have we increased the work, but we've also been doing it more quickly and more efficiently over that time period. Um, internal labor, we doubled our. Uh, employees at Liberty. We've also brought on additional contractors and consultants when needed to make sure that we are keeping up uh, at the same pace and scale that we need to to mitigate the risk and, and get the system in the shape that it is today. And as you can see, you know, removals and um, trees removed and pruned have, you know, that uh, per percentage has decreased a little bit. We were uh, previously over 50% of the trees that we worked, we removed. Uh, that number has gone down into the low 40%, uh, and the number of trees that we've pruned uh, has has increased greatly. So we're you know we're still doing a lot of uh, hazard tree removals. Again, a lot of that's dead trees on the system or dying trees on the system, um, but we've increased the number of trees that we've pruned eight times. Uh, in order to get that clearance work done. And a lot of that's attributed to the, the LIDAR program that we started implementing back in uh, 2020. So 2022 was the first year that we had the entire system pruned based off of that LIDAR work. So uh, that's the, the reason for that big jump between 21 and 22. Um, the next slide is just a, a kind of overview of, of our plan for the next three years. Uh, you know, we were around 700 miles of overhead lines. So we, our detailed inspection protocol is to make sure that all lines are inspected at least every three years, which would, you know, be those uh, 220 or so circuit miles each year. Uh, the LIDAR inspection, of course, is for the whole system. 
and then the mitigation of that work would equate to the inspection. So at least every three years, we're doing a detailed inspection and maintenance of, of every circuit mile on the system. We've also implemented a lot of uh, fuel reduction work, and that includes removing all of the debris that we generate from our work. Each customer has the option at this point if they want the wood to be left on site for themselves to use or for us to haul the wood away, we offer that to them. And that's been a really benefit to us, not only in, rec in reducing you know, surface fuels, but also previously customers would have objection to removing a tree because they didn't want the wood on the ground a lot of times the, the conversation was, well, I don't care about the tree. I just don't want the wood. And then, you know, that, that created more further delays in, in getting the work done. So it's also helped expedite that necessary hazard tree mitigation by offering that to customers. We've also worked with homeowners associations that are working on uh, becoming firewise communities to improve their defensible space by uh, increasing work that we do under our lines in those communities uh, and offering things like chipping uh, of debris from around their homes while we're out there doing work and really helping the community where we can. When we're doing work, being able to partner with those communities or agencies, uh, be it the firewise councils, uh, fire agencies, land uh, agencies, things of that nature to, to continue to not only you know mitigate the risk of the overhead lines, but you know if there were to be an ignition, uh, mitigate the chance that something became catastrophic due to uh, unnecessary fuel loading um, under our lines. You have two so minutes. Our, thank you. So we also have pole clearing. We clear uh, all of our subject poles each year, and again, we I mentioned our quality control inspection program that's based on. Um, you know, statistical methods to make sure that we have a, a valid sample of quality control of all the work and inspect inspections that we're doing. On the next slide uh, gives a little bit of a uh, outlook. Uh, so one of the things we're implementing this year is quality assurance. So instead of just going to quality control, we're also taking a random sample of the entire system at the span level and looking at those spans to see what condition are those spans in regardless of whether there's been inspection or maintenance works completed or working on risk modeling. We've heard a little bit about that from Elliot earlier. We're implementing additional training specific to our area of our ins uh, inspectors, uh, working on integrated vegetation management. So monitoring the plant communities that come up after work that's been completed. Uh, again, I mentioned the compatible plant giveaway to customers so that, you know, the, the, the plants, and um, plant communities that show up on our system are compatible from a reliability standpoint, also looking at you know, ability to um, help with wildfire mitigation. And, and again, with the amount of public land that we uh, work on, we've been doing a lot of work with um, partner agencies to collaborate to get more work done, combine resources, uh, to to provide more impact um, more impactful work together along our corridors. And that's all I have. Awesome. Thank you so much, Peter, for your presentation. Um, we will move on to Bear Valley with Jared and. Good afternoon, everybody. Can everybody hear me? Yes, we can. Perfect. All right, so I'm the wildfire mitigation and reliability engineer over here at Bear Valley. Um, so I run the veg management program, and I'm just going to do kind of a quick overview of what we did in 2022 and then what we're kind of planning on 2023 and forward. Next slide. So 2022 accomplishments, uh, we had no tree related ignitions, um, trimmed over 6,000 trees, which is a little lower for us. Um, we are facing a lot more um, dead trees 
that we have to kind of pivot to to remove. Um, but luckily, since we have such an aggressive trim standard, um, we're not seeing a lot of uh, the trees we've trimmed in the past growing very quickly, especially with the drier conditions. That may be changing here after the winter we just had, but we'll see. Um, we completed LIDAR and UAV uh, inspections across our whole BVS territory. The LIDAR numbers are showing um, that our trim trimming and uh, removal program is effective. Numbers continue to fall um, each year and each time we do it. This year we also, um, so our LIDAR is done mostly by vehicle mounted LIDAR. Um, and then some sections were completed by quad uh, UAVs or drones. Um, this year, our contractor got permission to do uh, fixed, wing, fixed wing drone LIDAR flyovers. So they're um, able to complete it much quicker. Um, with the quadcopters, they have to do a line of sight. So when they're going cross country kind of stuff, it would take them much, much longer to do. Um, pretty small spans and now we can do they can do it out of sight so they can do a lot larger spans much quicker um, this year we brought on a full-time pre-inspector which has been very helpful um, obviously planning for the future but they also go through all the lidar data to confirm um, each potential violation because there is you know um, a huge number that most of them are not actually violations, but it's just the way that either the LIDAR uh, technique picked it up and it said there might be something there. So he'll go out and confirm all the um, LIDAR before that stuff goes out to our crews. And then this year we implemented a brand new tree inventory system. It's called iRestore. It's a big upgrade from the last um, tree inventory system we had. Uh, this one is fully customizable uh, for what we need. And uh, it's geolocation, which is last one, it was the tree crews were kind of pinning where they thought the tree was. So it wasn't completely um, correct locations. And then this also has a huge list of um, tree data for each tree. Uh, another benefit to our new system is that depending on the type of tree and the uh, selected growth rate for that species, uh, so like say a pine, uh, the system automatically makes it uh, so it alerts you that it needs to be inspected every so often for that type of tree versus a fast growing tree would alert you after um, say a year it does need to be uh, annually looked at for us just to make sure they haven't gotten out of control and into the lines or anything like that. You have one minute. Okay, and then for 2023, we're going to kind of continue what um, our plan has been in the past, uh, complete at least 72 circuit miles, which we've been going above and beyond that. Um, remove 88 trees with strike potential if needed, which lately we've also gone above and beyond that. We're gonna continue with the UAV and LIDAR inspections on the whole service territory. Um, and then we do internal uh, QCs on the contractor's work. So we do at least 72 of those, which comes out to be about 15% of all trims. And then we're also gonna keep up um, updating our tree inventory system to meet our needs and, you know, whatever needs come in the future with uh, regulatory and data collection. So that's kind of where our pro uh, program's going. And thank you very much. Thank you, Jared. Um, and last but not least, we have Brian King from Pacificor. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My, my name is Brian King. Uh, I'm the Director of Environmental Vegetation Management for Pacific Power. Uh, pleased to be here today, and I will be giving a, a, an update of our vegetation management program initiatives associated with our long-term mitigation plan. Next slide. So 
So in, in 2022, uh, Pacific Corps completed over 1,100 miles of inspection associated with annual patrols, in addition to the approximate 1,500 miles of inspection or detailed inspection associated with our routine maintenance activities. In total, just to give a, a, an idea of the scope of work completed, in total, over 21,000 trees were pruned and over 10,000 trees removed. And roughly over 28 acres of brush was also removed during our 2022 activities. In 2023, we, we look forward to continue to implement our, our annual patrols in addition to our routine maintenance. Um, year to date, we have inspected over 1,000 miles of line associated with annual patrols, in addition to the approximate 830 miles associated with our routine maintenance activities, which equates to roughly 75% uh, complete or status of, of all of our inspection initiatives for the year. So we're making good progress in that regard. In total, over 13,000 trees have been pruned this year, uh, with just under 3,000 trees removed and over nine acres of brush removed as well. I also want to note uh, that we are also transitioning from a four year cycle to a three year cycle in California, thereby increasing the frequency of our, our detailed inspections. In 2022, we, we, also, we cleared vegetation at the base of over 3,000 wood poles in local responsibility areas. Uh, and this is in addition to the, the pole clearing program we have in our state responsibility areas. And we will continue to implement this program this year in 2023. Uh, with respect to our mobile data management software, we continue to identify any improvements and, and also recognize limitations to our current system as we continue to mature in this space. Um, we are looking for improvements to allow for more connectivity of our data and improvements, uh, thereby improving our tracking of our vegetation management. In 2022, uh, we increased our QAQC resources, quality control resources, and in 2023 hired our last uh, full time employee uh, in accordance with our plan, which has allowed for more flexibility in completing audit activities. Uh, throughout our service territory in the Pacific Northwest, we have a total of six FDPs tasked with post auditing, uh, as well as a senior forester who oversees the activities of this group. Um, throughout our service territory, uh, of the six FTEs, one FTE's primary area of responsibility is California, and we pull in on average two to four uh, other FTEs uh, with post audit to help out with post audit activities in California. Alexander. The QAQC program is, focuses on post audits. We were also, excuse me. Also having the, the team review inspections uh, prior to tree crews conducting the work. Uh, we are also, also incorporating the review of, of data uh, entered in by our vegetation management contractors to identify opportunities for improvement and improve data quality. Uh, lastly, in 2022, we identified areas to implement our enhanced overhang reduction pilot project. And in 2023, as implemented, move to the next slide i'll talk more about that you so have the, one minute the intent uh, of this pilot project is to gain a better understanding of additional resources impacts to trees and level of customer coordination needed in order to achieve a modified ground to sky clearance and determine the potential benefit with respect to reliability and decreasing wildfire emissions um, so we're in the infancy of, of implementing this program this year um, and we'll continue to implement and evaluate the results and monitor the trees and conditions in 2024 prior to coming to any conclusion uh, with respect to this pilot program. And we look forward to uh, continuing to identify opportunities for improvement and implementing our programs uh, throughout 2024. So, Alan, thank you. Thank you so much, Brian. Uh, we will move on to the panel portion of this session.
Um, we are joined by Henry Sweat from the CPUC. Hello, Henry. Um, and Greg Morris from the Green Power Institute. There he is. Hello, Greg. <laughs> Um, I have not chosen someone to go first, um, but Greg, since you are unmuted, would you like to ask the first question? <laughs> okay, I'd like to uh, just sort of start out simply. Um, when we were uh, looking at the WMPs of the IOUs, one of the things that sort of stood out to me in terms of the vegetation management sections was that many of them had failed to, uh, not, not just failed to meet their, their stated goals in terms of how much line was uh, cleared, uh, how many trees were trimmed and or um, removed. So my first question is simply, um, how has each of your companies done uh, in the past couple of years with respect to meeting your own stated goals for uh, doing the various VM tasks. Hey, this is Brian. I'll, I'll go first. And, you know, the um, thanks for the question, Gary. I, I think we're, in all, I think we're doing, doing well. We're trending in a positive direction. Um, we're, we're achieving our goals. Um, with our in, in accordance with our initiatives generally speaking with probably within plus or minus 10 percent uh, and continue to find opportunities for improvement to, to do better as we continue to implement these initiatives yeah we've gone quite above and beyond of meeting all of our veg management goals uh, whether it be circuit miles cleared uh trace trimmed or inspections completed For Liberty, I'd say, you know, we generally um, met our goals. I don't know if you could still, can you all hear me? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, yeah, sorry. Yeah, so, um, you know, and, and, you know, like Brian said, it, you know, if, if we're under, um, at, you know, it may be within a, a pretty small percentage. And you know, for example, last year, Due to high mortality rate, we shifted focus from detailed inspections of one area to do more patrol inspections for dead and dying trees in another area. So, you know, essentially, if you look at the, the planned inspection miles total between, you know, the different inspection methods, we exceeded our goals. It was just more of a, um, a matter of readjusting throughout the year. You know, we set a plan in December of the year, and then throughout the year, things may change and we have to adapt and be flexible to to meet the conditions so we you know we set our, our plans with the best information that we have at the time and then throughout the year we may um have to adjust those goals to to really meet the the needs uh, of the system uh i had a follow-up to greg's question um this is specifically for pacific core in your um, WMP table 819 of your QAQC program has your audit results of 2022 as 72% for routine cycle. Is that you guys only in, that you guys audited 72% of your miles, that you audited 72% of your goal, or that you had a 72% success rate? Now, good question. Um, can everyone hear me okay real quick? Because I, I think my sound might be coming in and out a little bit. Can you hear I me? Think when you when you uh, face more to your left, it sounds better than yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so um, with the uh, uh, Pacific Corps, we, we target a hundred percent post audits of of our of our work tree work that is in a result of our detailed inspections as well as our annual patrol inspections. And so with respect to our detailed inspections in 2022, that 72% uh, that you mentioned, that would have been, we post audited 72% of all line miles completed, all where we had tree work completed. And where we fell short on some of those areas in some, in 2022, we actually 
those line miles that we didn't post audit associated with the the uh, detailed patrol and corrective work were actually post audited post audited as part of our annual patrol. So all line miles had eyes on them, but as similar to uh, what Peter mentioned, you know, we were it kind of shifted a little bit within within those buckets, if you will. So all line miles were post audited, but we combined we combined some of that post audit effort because we worked that the same line under different multiple types of work activities, if that makes sense. Understood. Um, thank you. And you know, just also following up on Greg's question, uh, you know, in terms of your QAQC programs, what, and this is for all three utilities, what are your guys' fine rates right now on, you know, are you finding that you guys 100% compliance or is it, is it lower? Thank you. So I'll, I'll continue on first with Pacific Power. So I don't have a, a specific fine rate to, to mention. However, we do, we, we bucketize our, our audit findings, uh, basically a uh, a non-billable and billable, meaning non-billable are those those instances where the contractor did not complete something in accordance to our specifications, uh, something was missed, versus a billable exception being something that we identified on our post audit that we want to be, to be done per our discretion. Uh, and we the the non-billable items are far outweigh or far exceed the billable exception items so we're finding more just for our discretion from a conservative standpoint to do more it's not reflective of the contractors doing a poor job necessarily but i don't have a specific rate to give you this is jared from bear valley um i don't have the percentage number either but um Last year, we did about 15% QC of our uh, internal to the, of the contractor's work. And there was, I believe, under 10 findings. Um, so with us, when there, we're pretty small, the findings are pretty minimal, um, but I, I don't have those direct numbers off the top of my head, but we could definitely look into that. So for, for Liberty, when it, with regard to tree work, um, we have a really good um, pass rate for compliance um, uh, of completing the work. You know, I'm looking at the numbers here and we're, they're all, you know, high 90% pass rate for, for our system. A lot of the times, you know, and we ask our quality control inspectors for information addition to compliance. So um the contractor may get a, a a finding because of the cleanup wasn't to our standards and, and things of that nature and, and part of that um what we're looking at too with regard to inspections and maintenance and pole clearing you know we do quality control after the work is done to see how that works being performed within our scope so we have uh, it's stricter than i guess just a straight compliance check um, I would say that pole clearing is where we see the highest uh, fail rate or the lowest pass rate. And a lot of times it's not getting that full 10 feet around the poles and we'll have to send crews back to, to correct those. Anytime we do find a deficiency that is a compliance issue, all of those do get reworked by the contractor. Then we send quality control inspections back to verify that that work was done um, in compliance with the regulations. Um, it, and that's one of the things we're looking at doing this year with that quality assurance audit is to just go out, like I said, we were taking a random sample of the entire system, sending auditors out to that span, regardless of work was completed or not, and tell us, is in fact our program working? Are those spans in compliance? Because our, our expectation and our goal is 100% compliance for the system. And so I'm really interested to see what those results are, but we have pretty high confidence that that will have good results once we see that data start coming in. Uh, 
Uh, I actually, I um, don't Could I just quick follow up question? Yeah. About you, Colin. <laughs> um, and that is to each of you, uh, who does your QA, QC work? Is it in-house or a hired contractor? And um, and what qualifications do they have? I'll, I'll start. So we, we use a third party a contractor to do our quality control inspections and all of their inspectors are certified arborists and most of them have additional credentials. Uh, we have one registered professional forester, they're all tree risk assessment qualified uh, and have multiple years of experience in the utility industry. So I would say I, I believe for this contract, they all have at least five years utility vegetation management experience to be uh, uh, an auditor. So we have pretty, the, the qualifications to be an auditor is much higher than what we would require for somebody to be say a, a work planner or, or a pre-inspector. So for us at Bear Valley, we have a couple. Um, so in-house we do, um, so it's kind of our operations and supervisor roles. Um, in house, so they get, you know, they have the utility experience, and then they're also trained up on our, um, you know, protocols and standards and stuff like that. We have our pre inspector that works for the contractor that QCs all of their work, and then we also have a third party ISA certified forester um, that audits 100% of their work as well. It's important to keep those two functions separate, so it's exactly. good to have an independent. Yeah. So with with Pacific Power, our QA QC group is largely internal. Um, so we have uh, ISA certified arborists who conduct our our post audit activities. Um, they also are very many of them are work have their utility specialist certification. And we all, every, all of them are working towards, and some of them do have their draft or, or tree risk assessment qualification as well. Great, thank you. Um, before I ask one of my questions, I just want to make sure there's no additional follow up follow ups on uh, quality assurance and quality control. I'll just follow up that I thought Liberty's QAQC program results were really easy to understand and follow in their WMP. So just wanted to say thank you for that. Um, a, a follow up from Greg's earlier question, um, a question for Peter from Liberty. You mentioned that Liberty makes those like adjustments mid season to tackle, you know, priorities that come up. Um, and I was curious, like how those decisions are made to like shift gears and perhaps go to a different area, whether it's um, just like observations in the field or LIDAR data or whatever it might be. Sure. Yeah, a, a lot of that is a combination of information coming from the field, from our internal arborists, um, our inspectors on the ground, you know, reporting what they're finding, and then, you know, customers call in and, you know, once we start getting, you know, 15, 20 calls a week from customers on the same circuit about a dead tree on their property, um, you know, it, it's, really makes a difference in where we do. And so, for example, last year we had scheduled one one circuit for uh, inspection. We weren't really finding a lot of needed work on that section. And, and the section that we shifted to, we had just completed. So we assumed it would be in good shape. But, you know, once we started seeing the mort mortality come in, we essentially finished that circuit, turned around and went right back to the start of it and started all over again. And we're probably about to start again on that same circuit uh, now. So it's just, you know, we have, what I would say is kind of a hybrid cycle-based program and a condition-based program. So we, you know, the detailed inspections are really that that cycle-based approach and those those patrol inspections are more condition-based and the LIDAR uh, is, is all condition-based. 
here. Disappointing to hear that there's so much mortality, but um, good that you are you all are keeping up with it and your customers are aware um, of the issues and the help that you can give them. Um, I feel like we followed up on Greg's question several times, uh, and I want to make sure that Henry can ask a question, a novel question. Um, I feel like I did if Greg wants to go ahead, but <laughs> otherwise I have more. Uh, uh, I'll go for it then. Um, ahead, I think, I think uh, from what I'm seeing, it seems like you guys have kind of two levels of inspections, the patrol inspections that seem to happen every year, and then a detail inspection that happens more on the order of three years. Um, and it, from what I heard, the detailed inspection, it's specifically targeted towards identifying hazard trees. Um, can you guys explain uh, a little bit more on how you guys are identifying the hazard trees? You know, um, in sdg and and SE's case, they literally, I think, are doing a 360 on every single one of their strike trees. Um, are your people just walking, you know, down the line and doing a classic utility ISA level one or ANSI 300 inspection? What's the level that you're going to on these detailed inspections? Thank you. Sure, I'll, I'll start. So for, for us, you know, the, the detailed inspections, um, are, are really comprehensive. So, you know, they are focusing on, on hazard trees and they're doing a uh, level two inspection. So they're looking at every side of that tree, looking at whether it can strike. We're also giving them additional data to review regarding what's the fire risk rating of that span to determine, you know, um, you know how to prioritize those trees they have access to the LIDAR data so they can tell, in fact, is it tall enough to strike or not? So it's it's a it's an extremely comprehensive inspection. And then if they find anything beyond that, you know, like a dead tree, they're letting us know about those and they're they're reviewing those and inspecting them. Uh, clearances, we have specific criteria for them to look at if for whatever reason there's a miss, then they'll they'll flag those for us. And so the deep like the detailed inspections that are occurring um every year throughout the year and the goal is to not have more than three years pass before re repeating you know to to one we're actually probably getting below that um at this point now but the patrol inspections is more of your it, i would say closer to that level one type inspection where they're looking for dead trees primarily dead and dying trees that can strike the facilities and so for um, qualifications too, usually, you know, um, somebody that's new around the system will start them doing control inspections. They have to be certified arborists before they can even be, do any detailed inspections and things of that nature. So, you know, there, there's a lot more knowledge base going into the folks doing those detailed inspections. Um, did that answer the question? Was there more? I think it does, but I just want to, you're, for these detailed inspections that occur maximum every three years, you're doing a level two on every strike tree. Is that, did I hear that right? Yeah. Yes. Oh, does your, do you know if your WMP says that? The... Probably, probably not, you know, and okay. I, I would say to clarify, so we're, we're not, I wouldn't say every tree that's tall enough to strike our lines, we're not doing a level two inspection on them. Right. Every tree, while we're while we're performing inspections, any tree that has a defect or has potential, right, that is a concern, you know, as they're patrolling, then they do it, uh, or as they're inspecting, then they do that that level two inspection of that tree. So, if, if that makes sense. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So with Pacific Power, so well, I want, I want to say uh, any any inspection we do, we identify uh, hazard trees. So on detailed inspections, we will identify hazard trees, hazard trees. Annual inspections the same, and basically any other reason we go out to do an inspection, if there is one, we will identify and work it. So our goal is not to walk by one. Um, so on our, with respect to the inspections. 
we generally will do you know level one assessment with our, our typical standard base standard and that's the same for all inspections and where the inspector then has the ability with using their professional judgment if needed to go and do then conduct a level two assessment on a tree that's maybe more questionable right that's not fully obvious that it's one they need to list as a tree for removal so in that scenario that they have the ability to go and do a level two assessment of social work of those trees based on their professional judgment. Yeah, for us at Bear Valley, very similar. Um, we are so small that we are getting uh, eyes on our territory many, many times every year on every pretty much asset just because you can drive the whole thing in a couple of days. Um, same thing, we don't, it's not, they're not doing a level two assessment unless deemed necessary um, by our, our arborist. Um, so it's mostly through all the other different patrol inspections. And then um, additionally, as of this year, our fire department in, uh, hired a um, arborist and they have been um, flagging a ton of dying and dead trees that you know may or may not hit our lines and those well you know they'll reach out to us so we'll do a further inspection on those trees as well but that's another resource we've been using to identify um, hazard trees on top of all of our other inspection programs Excellent question, Henry. You actually stole one of my questions. So, <laughs> um, Craig, would you like to ask the next question? Yes, thank you. So, <clears throat> of all the things that a utility can do to raise the ire of their customers, the second most uh, difficult is to do a poor job of trimming or removing trees on their property. Of course, the first is burning their house down. So obviously this isn't quite as severe, uh, but it, it actually does uh, raise the ire of your customers if they feel that you've done a poor job of, uh, first of all, communicating with them. And second of all, how you treat the job site. and Again, I'm going to bring up the IOUs. They, a lot of objections to the IOUs is that they've been bringing in the cheapest, and, and we understand they want to keep their costs down, but they've been bringing in really cheap contractors who cut and run, in, in essence, uh, and leave a mess. And uh, obviously, the, the landowners are pretty upset about it. Now, I'm very impressed with what we've heard from uh, Liberty in this respect. And one thing that the Green Power Institute's been trying to push for quite a while is communicate with the customers and offer them uh, removal options, work with them to encourage them uh, to, to uh, participate with you in getting this job done as well as you can. So um, with respect to Liberty, the one thing I didn't see in your WMP, which I'm curious about is, what do you do with the brush and uh, residue wood that you remove? So I it depends on sometimes location and and things of that nature so you know in cross country circuits um uh we'll sometimes come in with a track chipper and chip and broadcast material and then haul that haul the wood out with um with equipment where we can get access and things of that nature while um we have a couple facilities that we use that have various i guess end uses for, for the wood. So there's a, a sawmill that we've been taking uh, wood to recently. Um, there's a, a company that does composting. So they'll take our, our material, turn it into compost. And a lot of that material ends up going back into 
into the basin for revegetation projects and things of that nature. Um, and, uh, you know, some of the facilities we take it to will turn it into wood mulch and sell that to customers as, as a, a, you know, a byproduct of, of the material that we bring them or take it to cogen facilities. Okay, all good stuff. And you've had real success in reaching out to your customers and having them appreciate the services you've uh, offered from what I understand. So, and I think yeah. that kind of a program in particular would also work for uh, Bear Valley because you're really um, connected to your customers in a very uh, obvious way. So I would really encourage you guys to go the extra mile to look at the waste and cleanup and residue collection. It's a whole different story, I'm sure, for Pacific Corp because the nature of your uh, territory is extremely rural. Um, nonetheless, whatever you can do to, you know, work with instead of uh, sort of against or, you know, and we do a very similar, um, you know, approach to it. We will haul away 100% of what we do trim or cut down unless the homeowner wants the wood. Well, then we will leave the, uh, just, you know, we'll limit up and stuff, but we'll take all that with us. But that's part of our program is that we do take everything with us. No, oh, okay. And we also, unless it's in the forest or service area, sometimes they can request certain things with certain trees they'll want us to limit and then leave the base of it or kind of changes with forest service stuff but um we do a fair amount of i because i i am the kind of the vegetation department at our company so i deal with all the customers myself and so i mean they call and that i they get me and we work through it so they do know that and i feel pretty confident that I try to make every customer as happy as possible because we do have that luxury. Good. You should brag about it in your WMB. <laughs> I saw a lot more about it in Liberty's than in yours, but it's good. Yeah. And for Pacific Power, just on this topic, um, uh, it, I, I definitely agree with you. It, it is. It's, it's an issue, right? It's a concern of customers, and it's something that we are looking into to see how we might be able to modify what we do. But we are very spread out, as you as you indicated, and so in those rural, those you know hard to access areas, you know we will, if we can get a chipper in there, we will chip the slash, leave the the bowl of the tree, the trunk of the tree on the ground, or cut it into manageable legs. Um, if we can't, we will lock, get a chipper up, we will lock and scatter the, the debris off right of way, again, leaving the, the wood, the bull, the tree, the trunk. Um, in de developed areas, we're definitely uh, chipping all the slash, removing that unless the, the landowners want it. Um, but, you know, because we're so remote in remote areas, we are finding a lot of customers actually want their their the, the trunk of the tree for firewood and, and things of that nature as well or if we were to remove it we may cause more damage and environmental impact to try to remove that one uh, log out in the middle of nowhere where there's no access so but i, I definitely hear you Greg, on that and we are looking into that and contemplating different things and and just for what it's worth uh you do have uh, several biomass power plants in your region so they're yeah. always looking for chips. Yep. Great question, Greg, and thank you. Um, we will move back to Henry. Uh, one question that I had is, I think at least two of the SMJUs are starting to use um, LIDAR on a regular basis. Um, how have you guys, and then I've also, I think all, all three of you guys are, have a tree 
database. How are you guys incorporating the LIDAR data, using it to find strike trees, and incorporating that into your tree database? And just generally, how, what does your tree database consist of? Is it only trees that you guys are working on? Does it include just strike trees, all of your strike trees, you know, and how, you know, how does it kind of get used? And I know that last question is really, really broad, but um, thank you. So uh, at, at Liberty, we we work with the LiDAR vendor to update the the database um, with the, the tree records of, of trees that we've worked and um, all of the all of the tree tops essentially, are, you know, we will have one one point per tree gets uploaded into our um, software that we use for work planning and issuing work. And so when the inspector is in the field, if there's a tree that is um, that isn't already recorded in the in the work management system, they will pull up the light the layer with all the lighter points and select it. That will auto populate some of the tree information on the work order, and then that essentially pulls it into the inventory. And then at the end of the year, when we go back to the lighter vendor, we send them all of the work maintenance data so that we'll also have those records tied together and, and it's it's a it's a it's an extremely difficult process to just take lidar data and take work management data and marry those two it's almost impossible because the accuracy of the gps locations doesn't match so really the best way or the only way to do that is to go out when you're out there creating work orders and then pulling that lidar data into the work management system so our plan is to continue to do that over time as we're creating work orders using the LIDAR data and using that to update the inventory within our work management system. So for us, Bear Valley, um, we don't um, use the LIDAR data into our database unless um, we're doing work on that tree. We found just too many inconsistencies of data just not being right for us with the current LIDAR capabilities that we're using. Um, there's so many points that it does bring up and a good amount are not correct. Um, so we just, it, it, we're only entering the trees that we're trimming in that case with the LIDAR data um, into our system. With the second part was, how are we kind of using the database? Is that correct? Yes. Um, so currently, um, our pre-inspector is entering trees that are need to be worked on since it, uh, we are going into this brand new database. Um, it's that's our priority for that. Um, in the future, we'll we, you know we're going to be looking into entering any tree within striking distance of the lines. But as of right now, they're not entering those in. And for Pacific Power, uh, Pacific Core, with, with respect to the LIDAR, um, we're definitely in the infancy. We conducted uh, some pilot studies in 2020, but at that time, uh, we didn't identify a, a path forward to program implementation. Um, we're, we're kind of in that mode of, of learning from our peers with respect to, to LIDAR application, its usefulness, as well as satellite imagery. Very interested in that space, but but in the infancy for us in that space, and we'll continue to, to learn from our peers and, and coordinate, and collaborate in that regard. Uh, with respect to the second part of the question, kind of, I'll speak to what our inventory kind of looks like. Um, a little, it sounds like we're a little probably a little different than the the other utilities in this regard, in the sense that we our inventory is not a tree at the tree level. It's not a tree specific inventory where we do not have each individual tree receiving, for example, a unique identifier where we can look at the, the history of that tree through time. Our inventory, we, we collect inventory of vegetation management work that is needed annually, probably more at the uh, parcel or part uh, property uh, uh, granularity, if you will. So we may say on this property, there are five trees that need to be 
work and we'll collect the species and information about those five trees, but but we don't retain a history of what work was done on those trees through time. With that. So we're collecting an inventory of the work we need to, to execute on for that individual calendar year. And then we retain that information so we can compare it to future years and so forth to identify any trends and, and get an idea of the volume of work we might expect in any given year so we can plan for that activity. Brian, can you look at, if you do it by the parcel level, can you look at previous years work on that parcel? Um, yes and no, uh, because we, we transitioned to this new system just a couple of years ago and have been improving it and making changes as we go. So we've only, we've been collecting uh, more of that species specific and a little bit more detail with respect to the trees themselves on that parcel, like the quantity and so forth and species only only for the past year or two years or so. So it's, it's limited in our capability of looking back at that level, um, but it's things we, we want to explore. Thank you. And so, Brian, on your database, it's my guess is when you say parcel, is, are you, is it like categorized by source side device or like basically after the fuse or after a certain poll? And then and then that's why you said parcel because it, it's not really a, is that, yeah. So yeah, good question. So let me clarify, when I say parcel, it's property parcel, like a property. Okay. So for example, how our system works is the inspector will go to a property, a location and drop a, a pin, like in Google, right? Drop a pin and then we collect information attached to that via various forms they fill out. And depending on the size of the, pro the property, there may be multiple pins if there's a lot of work, you know? Uh, but generally speaking, where work is identified on a property, there's at least one pin drop, if you will, where they collect and, and record that data. If there's no work identified on a parcel, as they go through that property and inspect it, they won't drop the pin and collect any data. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Henry, for the question. Any additional follow-ups, Henry or Greg, on that one, on inventory? OK, we will bounce back to Greg. OK, I have one more uh, question for each of the uh, three utilities here. Um, and, and I uh, have to admit, uh, having gone through all these different WMPs and sometimes gets a little confusing as to who's doing what, but if you would please describe uh, what efforts you are making and or thinking of making with respect to longer range vegetation planning in the vicinity of the rights of way, in other words, where you're trying to not only uh, trim and clear uh, for the present and couple of years, but to actually transition the uh, vegetation around or through the right of ways to uh, plants that are slower growth and better form and you know what I mean. So I'd just be curious to see what the different companies are doing. I'll, I'll start, Greg. Um, you know, the, the, when you ask that question, the, the first thing that jumps to mind is IBM, right? It's trying to it's, get, it's, sorry. Uh, integrated vegetation management, mm -hmm. try to get those compatible species, low growing species within the rights of way. And, you know, wh where I see the biggest opportunity for Pacific Corps is, is within our transmission rights of way at this time, to where we, we are actually this year. I didn't note it earlier, but we are doing some additional uh, vegetation clearing activities, brush clearing and so forth within our transmission rights of way, portions thereof in California this year. And we're looking forward to trying to grow that, that program, if you will, and creating a, a more comprehensive transmission plan, maintenance plan, where we can really start to uh, achieve those desired outcomes, as you mentioned there. 
Um, so we're, we're, we're definitely looking in with that long-term vision and trying to, to uh, leverage what we currently are doing uh, to, to realize those, those long-term benefits. Yeah, at, at Liberty, we're looking in, you know, the similar respects uh, to implement a, you know, robust integrated vegetation management plan for our system. You know, part of that in the last few years has been a lot of reclamation and getting lines cleaned up and in good order, like you alluded to at the beginning of your question. Um, and I mentioned in my presentation partnerships, uh, which is big for us. I mean, we're, we're all, we, we don't really have wide transmission corridors. You know, we're, we're working with, you know, you know, 30, 50, 60 foot um, wide rights away. So, so it's hard to get that kind of traditional wire zone, border zone effect that you might see, you know, when looking at the kind of traditional transmission model. But what we are doing is working with uh, the land um, agency partners where, you know, maybe we have a, a narrow right of way where we are actually have our easement. But for example, with the forest service, there's a plan to get the, um, to, to get the, the forest next to our lines cleared. And we're looking at, okay, once that's done, what do we do? Um, in addition to when for example, Calder fire came through and there was a lot of bulldozing happening. A lot of that was happening, you know, in and around our lines because they're just natural breaks where they'll say we'll go through. And so we're, we're starting to monitor what is what's actually coming back in those areas that that were disturbed. Um, we've hired a consulting company that specializes in this type of work. We've had a native plant specialist come out and inventory some compatible plants that are naturally occurring on our system and providing training to our arborists so that they can identify those, those plants when they come up and also have an understanding of the plant communities based on different geographies in our, in our service area so that they could think about while we're work planning, you know, um, how we can prescribe work that has that long-term vision, but it's a long, I mean, you know, we're, we're, we're looking at, you know, an initial, you know, three years of just really getting, getting the initial training and monitoring done. And then, you know, probably five years to see what starts coming back and, you know, 10 years down the road. But, but to your point, you know, that long-term vision is something that we're really, really focusing on for our program. And, and right now it's, it's um, raising the IQ of all the people working on our system to have that um, foresight when we're planning and, and, and implementing work uh, so that we can start working towards that, you know, vision that we have for the program. It, it's a long-term plan, but it doesn't start till you start it. <laughs> so, no. Right. For us at Bear Valley, you know, we have even less lines that have large right of way since we don't have any transmission. Um, uh, pretty much all of our lines are along the streets and in private property. So a big way that we are going to just continue to do is kind of the education of right tree, right place. And you know, that's kind of the main way we can kind of affect it and go about it since we don't have, you know, that issue of needing to have large right of ways. What, what are you doing on the Radford line? But, so yeah, the Radford line is about two miles or something like that. Uh, we're not doing, we haven't started any kind of tree planting or anything like that. It's just uh, probably, we, it, it runs under our same program of tree cutting to, um, you know, 12 feet, uh, but there is a lot wider area on the Radford line as of right now, but we haven't done any kind of um, special tree planting or anything like that on the Radford line. Thank you. Time to do it is, of course, when it's clear and, you know, about to regrow something.
Um, Henry, um, do you have another question? I can, if you want me to. Go, go I, for it. We got 20 minutes. I got, I mean, this one's kind of a softball, but you know what, in the last five years, obviously everyone's been really working hard on their vegetation management programs. What are you guys seeing as your biggest improvements and lessons learned in, over the last five years? So this is Brian for the time. I think you know over the last five years, as we we've trans one thing I'll I'll point out like, that jumps to mind is our transition from a paper-based tracking system to electronic. And and that has been very, very critical in, in our growth and, and maturity in, in, in this space. Um, you know, before 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 that, paper-based, very decentralized with at the forester forester level where now it's not perfect but it's, it's better than what we had before where where we have more information more centralized available at our fingertips across our service territory so the foresters myself everyone can look into this and kind of pull the data and do whatever analysis we want with that data to see what story it tells you and so that that's been one of the, the biggest improvements over I think the past five years is is that data quality. We have a long way to go, honestly, right? Because we still have issues with contractors entering in incorrect data, garbage in, garbage out kind of uh, difficulty. Um, to be honest, um, but but we're making strides. We're making great improvements, and so with that data is power, and we're able to make more informed decisions moving forward. So for us at Bear Valley, um, I think it's just the addition of all so many different inspections. Um, the LIDAR is just going over the LIDAR data um, gets eyes on everything just because there is at least, you know, one potential violation since it goes out to over 12 feet. So there is going to be potential violations that need to be checked out. So we're getting eyes on every single pole, on every single tree, multiple, multiple times every single year. So there it's, we're, we're, yeah. So we're just seeing everything multiple times. And I think that's a huge benefit to keeping the um, distance for the trees and the lines. Yeah, at, at Bear Valley, we Liberty, and sorry, I, I lost video here, but hopefully my phone's still working. But I, I think, you know, the LIDAR that that um, was mentioned, the, you know, moving from a paper-based work management system to a digital system are both things that we've um, seen big improvements in, in being in efficiencies and things like that. Uh, the wood hauling that we mentioned is, is another one. And, and I, I guess I'd, you know, it, should go without saying, but all of these improvements um, cost a lot of money and I, I, we wouldn't have been able to do any of it without increased funding um, and support from our management and executive team. You know, when we started working on this in, you know, 2019, 2020, we were authorized to recover $4 million for vegetation management inspections. Um, in our last rate case, that was increased to $11 million, and, and we're actually have been exceeding those costs in the last three years. So um, I, I guess it's, when the rubber hits the road, the biggest accomplishment is getting the funding that we need to actually get all this work done. Great. Thanks, Henry. Um, thanks, everybody. Um, anywhere, I, you know, Greg, I know you said that was your last question, but I'm happy to open it up again if you want. Um, I think I have, I have one that has not been answered, so. Bye. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm done, so. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I think you've all touched on it just a little bit, um, but, you know, many of you have uh, different relationships with federal land managers in particular, um, you know, you're up in the forest, you're around BLM land. So I'm just kind of curious, any um, 
progression on relationships with the Forest Service or with BLM or other federal land managers um, and any like advice you might have to other utilities um, on those developing those relationships. Hey, Brian. Um... <laughs> Sorry about that. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. So regarding that, one the first thing that jumps to my mind is, is time. You have to take the time to build that relationship with that, that agency. And you know, one thing that we're working on, and I imagine other utilities are as well, are operations and maintenance plans specific with say the Forest Service or Bureau of Land Management that not only details, you know, our our line maintenance of the wire side of the, the company, but also speaks to our vegetation management activities. And so that just through that coordination and collaboration with the agencies developing these documents, we're able to conduct educational outreach to the agency as well. So they learn better what we do, how we do it. And so when we come knocking on the door saying we need to do something, it, it fosters there's, this, there's a increased level of understanding and from that more efficiency. So we're able to do what we need to do. Fewer, fewer, we're starting to see, I guess I would say fewer roadblocks, if you will, because of that collaboration and outlining roles and responsibilities within these operations and maintenance plans. So that's, that's one area. For uh, Bear Valley, I can't speak on the permitting processes like for the Radford line that has been held up for quite some time now, but for conducting veg management work, um, we have had no problems because um, most of our lines that are in the forest go to their lease cabins. So when we do trims or removals, um, they seems to have the effect that we're, you know, helping them out or um, providing them a service. So they've always been quite um, easy to work with on the vegetation management front though. Um, and then, yeah, again, it's, you know, fostering relationships and um, returning phone calls and not ignoring email, stuff like that, you know, get on people's good graces and work usually starts to get done that way. Yeah, for for Liberty, it's been um, it, it's been an interesting few years. But I think the biggest thing that's helped us is there was a, um, a categorical exclusion for a project on Forest Service land that was um, decided a few years ago uh, for the Forest Service to complete work. And uh, in addition to that, you know we partnered with the national forest foundation um, who also has a master um, stewardship agreement with the forest service and so we they work um, with us to get some of these larger projects done i mean routine maintenance is, um, is is a different story and you know some of the things that we've done to improve routine maintenance is you, you know but the Forest Service is, is as constrained as, as anybody when it comes to resources. So what we found has helped where, you know, we're waiting on a, on a heritage survey before we can get work done. Well, we went and hired a, a consultant who's an archaeologist that will go out and do the surveys for them. Um, we, we had a, uh, a permit for, for all the, you know, cultural resources uh, completed for our service area. So that covers uh, the entire forest as opposed to going from section to section. So I think helping them where they need help to get some of the, that work done has helped and then make sure that we're meeting our timelines because they have, you know, they have their plans. And so if we say, you know, this is our work plan for the year, but we don't get, we don't get all the inspection data to them till, you know, August, it's kind of <laughs> hard for them to get all that back to us so that we can get the work done. So we've adjusted our timeline, for example, on all of our detailed inspections and all of our patrol inspections at the beginning of the year, we do everything that's on the Forest Service first and submit all of that to the Forest Service and then circle back to the private property. So it's just a matter of working within their, um, 
structure as best as we can. I mean, I think my, my philosophy is we're not going to change the Forest Service or how they do the work. So the best thing that we can do is adapt our practices to help them streamline their processes as much as possible. But it's, I mean, it, it, it's been a, um, it, it's been challenging at times. There's been some heated conversations at times, um, but we now have, you know, bi-weekly calls with the Forest Service update progress of projects that we're working on and that they're working on and that communication, like Jared mentioned, has been uh, key in, in making sure that we are all on the same page to get that work done. Great, thank you everybody. Um, that's all the questions I have. I'll take this one last opportunity to ask Henry or Greg if you have any last questions. Okay, um, thank you all again. Thank you utility representatives for your presentations and Henry and Greg for your great questions. Um, I We are a couple minutes early, but I will pass it back to Jessica. Great, thank you so much, Colin, and thank you everyone for the presentations and for a really good discussion. Um, we will now move into the open question and answer session. Um, this is a chance for folks to ask any remaining questions, follow-up questions covering any of the topics um, or sessions that we've um, gone through today. Um, and we have a little over an hour, so um, don't be shy. Um, as a reminder, folks can raise their hand or use the Q&A function um, in Zoom to write in any questions they may have. Zoe, I see you have your hand raised. Go ahead. Yeah, thanks. I have a, um, a follow-up question for Liberty on the vegetation management work. You guys do the tree and plant giveaway, and so I'm curious as to if this is kind of supporting that customer satisfaction element to your vegetation management work, and is it, I mean, do you have any data or insight on if it's kind of facilitating the right tree, right place um, challenge? I, th I think this is Blaine with Liberty. I think Peter is trying to reconnect his audio. He lost audio. I don't know if, um, Elliot, I don't know if you can answer the question. Are you still on? It's like we can wait and if there's another question, uh, we can wait for him to get his audio back. Okay, sounds good. And perhaps, Blaine, I don't know if you can hear me, or Peter, I don't know if you can hear me. Um, you might try um, dropping and, and then rejoining the Zoom. Maybe that might help. Yeah, I'll, I'll text Peter. Sounds good. Thank you. I can ask a, another um, follow-up question on the VM work. Um, the the panelist questions kind of, I think they touched on this, so it might be a bit redundant, but with all of the tree die-offs that we're seeing across California, it seems like the SMJ user are really seeing this manifest in their right-of-ways and in their territories. And so my question is, have you considered just standardizing more frequent detailed inspections to um, basically keep up on the tree die-off challenge? Uh, this is Brian, so a good, good question. And we, we have increased our frequency for, for detailed inspections from four years to three years. But one, one other thing that we are kind of doing to try to help address this issue is we're using our post audit in a, in a strategic manner. So what I mean by that is in some cases, maybe depending upon the, the circuit, we may delay the post audit some period of time because of tree die off and tree die back. So that from when the work was completed to when we go and look at it again, so that we capture a, a higher number of trees that are starting to climb 
and then address those trees through our post audit service. Um, so that's one one way, kind of a modified way, where we're also trying to address that issue. Yeah. Brian, is that? I just wonder, is that going to skew your audit if you have additional die-offs that they just shouldn't have caught because they're kind of new manifestation? Yeah. It's not, so we we uh, categorize those differently. So billable versus non-billable. So basically, meaning. If it's a non-billable, meaning it's, it's, an, it's an exception that the contractor missed and should have done, we're not going to pay for them to go back. They should have done it to begin with, for example. Whereas these types, this scenario that I'm describing would be a billable uh, exception, meaning we will we want the contractor, we as Pacific Power identified something um, that we want them to do above and beyond uh, what's uh, Above and beyond, so we're, we're paying for it. So, long story short, we're we're still categorizing those differently, so we can separate that out and not skew that result. And then for us at Bear Valley, um, our problem <clears throat> isn't necessarily identifying them, um, because I said, like I said earlier, we do have so many programs going on where we get eyes on our system multiple multiple times a year. Um, our our challenge is getting the work completed with the resources we have, since we have such limited resources. Um, luckily, we completed our first full cycle trim of the whole valley to pretty at minimum 12 feet. So a lot of that has been holding um, as we're going through again. So we are reallocating resources from like just circuit mile trimming two additional removals um so that's kind of more our problem we have more trees dying so fast that we can't keep up to remove them it's not about identify them identifying them for us is a problem great and i see we have peter back on the line um, i am back yeah hopefully you can you can hear me and see me and i'm fully functional again so if you can maybe repeat the question and i'll uh do my best to answer thanks peter two questions for you so we'll start with the one that the other smgs just answered um my question it's a little bit redundant to what was asked previously but a slight different lilt to it so um with the massive die-offs that they've been seeing in the last year across California. Basically the SMJUs, you guys are experiencing this along your right of ways. And so my question was, if you are considering um, standardizing more frequent detailed inspections to basically pick up that more rapid tree die-off rate and mitigate the, the risk. Yeah, so really what we, um do is uh, will increase the frequency of our patrol inspections because they're, you know, the detailed inspections usually take a bit longer because they're looking for things in addition to just, you know, dead trees. They're looking for green hazard trees and things like that for the detailed inspection. So we'll increase the rate of patrol inspections and that's specifically just to say, you know, any, any dead tree or, or tree that has, you know, 50% more um, die off uh, that's dying to to mark those trees and so we we have been doing that um to to try and keep up with it great thanks and then my my other question was specifically for um liberty and so you guys have the tree and plant giveaway program and my question is whether or not this program is facilitating the customer satisfaction, facilitating access to properties? And is it, um, do you have any, you know, insights on whether or not it's mitigating the wrong tree, wrong place and facilitating the right tree, right place kind of mentality in customers? Yeah, so, you know, initially we, we went into it with the idea of, of like a tree replacement program, like, hey, if we remove your tree, we'll replace it with something else. Um, and, and ultimately decided, you know, based on the size of our territory and customer base that we could just offer that to all customers, regardless of whether we're doing work on their system or not. 
Um, and, and I, I agree with the potential wrong tree, wrong place um, philosophy. And so when we, you know, with our partners, when we, we select the materials that are given away, we will not give away anything that at mature height will conflict with power lines. So, you know, I've worked at other utilities where it's like, hey, we'll give you a red oak. And it, it's like this, it makes no sense. It seems counterintuitive to me to really promote the idea of right tree, right place. We only give away plant materials that we consider compatible with our system. Great, thanks. Great, thanks Zoe for the question and Peter um, for your responses. I do see we have a written question in the Q&A from Jonathan Frost from the Wildfire Safety Advisory Board. This is another question for Liberty um, on the topic of collaboration with the federal landowners, what has Liberty learned from its experience with the Forest Resilience Corridors Project with the U.S. Forest Service? Um, one of the things that we've really had to understand is that, you know, the Forest Service is in the business of, of timber harvest plans, and we're in the business of you know, vegetation management for utility infrastructure. And so I think initially a lot of the conflict was because we were, we thought we were on the same page with the same goals. And, you know, it took probably about a year and a half of, of <laughs> you know, um, debate and arguing till we realized like, okay, we there's the ultimate like goal that we have, but how we get there is done in two different approaches. And so, you know, for us, the biggest lesson learned is, is A, you know, how can we, like I mentioned before, work within their processes and procedures because they're, you know, they have federal mandates that they have to follow. There's nothing that we can say or do that's gonna, you know, make them skip checking one of their boxes. They've got all of their boxes to check and they, you know, for better or worse, are gonna make sure that they're all checked. So what we've been trying to do is facilitate that process as best as we can. And like I said, sometimes that means providing resources to do the work that technically they're supposed to do for us to do the work, but we don't want to wait, you know, for them to have to get, you know, another resource on board or something. So, you know, working with them to do that. And, and with the resilience corridors thing, really the biggest um, success is, is reaching that agreement with the National Forest Foundation to administer the work. So, you know, they're, they're kind of the middleman between what we're doing, what the Forest Service is doing, and they keep lines of communication open. And their whole purpose is to get this project in, implemented. So when we need to make decision or we need to foster communication, they're really good at helping that communication line stay open and that we're, we're really achieving that goal. And, and that was a two year process just to get that agreement in, um, executed. So it, it wasn't an easy feat, but we, we did see the benefit of it and, it and it's already paying off in dividends to get that agreement executed. Great. Thank you so much for that, Peter. Other folks, feel free to Oops, sorry, I muted myself. <laughs> I was just um, saying other folks who have questions, feel free to raise your hand or um, drop it in the Q&A.
I'm not seeing any hands raised at the moment and nothing in the Q&A. Um, I'll give it a couple more minutes for folks. Um, we can certainly end early if we need to. I know it's been um, a day of some really good discussion and presentations and it's getting towards the end of the day. So I'm happy to end early if there are no further questions, but I'll give it just a few more um, minutes for folks. I do see we have a follow-up question from Jonathan Frost um, from the question earlier. Is there anything that the CPUC or the other utilities can learn from focusing on vegetation um, as far as a thousand feet away from the lines, as in the case with the US Forest Service Program in Tahoe? So this would be a question for um, all the utilities. I don't know, Peter, you want to start start us off. <laughs> sure. Yeah, I, I think um, you know, I, I, I think one of the, the lessons to learn is that it's, you know, to get to where we are today it is a process that started, I, I want to say probably like five years ago. Um, you know, with regard to putting a plan together with the Forest Service going through the NEPA process for the categorical exclusion, um, getting the partnership agreement executed with the NFF, both with their uh, master stewardship agreement with the Forest Service and our agreement with them to help uh, support their work through funding that it, it's one of those things that it's, um, you need A, the Forest Service, the Forest Supervisor has to be really invested in in that work um, because it's all that work is happening on Forest Service land. None of it's on Liberty land. They're implementing the work. They're putting the contracts out and we're really facilitating from the utility standpoint, um, A, through some funding so that they can secure more grant funding to do that work. Um, and then beyond that, you know, we're still really focusing on what we do and that's maintaining the trees that are um, you know, potential to have conflicts with the power line. So um, it, if the Forest Service or whoever the Forest Supervisor is in that district is not invested in that program, it's, it's just, it's going to be impossible to get it to work. So I think the first thing would be to start having those conversations with the local um, district uh, Forest Service and, and, and start the process. Great, thanks, Peter. Um, Jared or Brian, do you have anything to add to that? This is, this is Brian. Uh, I'll just add that, you know, I mentioned earlier operations and maintenance plans, and it, it's basically an, an agreement with the land managing agency on how we do what we do and identifies roles and responsibilities. But it's a good starting point to our, our springboard to look at projects off right of way. Um, such as this in this instance, um, and 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 it takes a lot of time, as as was as Peter has mentioned. You know, these projects, you, you just can't; they just don't start overnight. There's a lot of prior planning, a lot of environmental analysis and support that goes into that. But I I think the trajectory that Pacific Power is on with developing these operations and maintenance plans, it, it allows us. Uh, a little bit more flexibility and opportunities to have those discussions with our land managing uh, stakeholders, agencies. And so I, I see us pursuing, continuing to pursue that avenue with developing those, those agreements 
and keeping an eye towards other opportunities that we may be able to collaborate on with the Forest Service or Bureau of Land Management, for example. The only thing I um, have to add on top of that is that I don't know if it would really be applicable for Bear Valley just because we don't have any transmission lines um, and we have such little amount of lines um, that would need a right away. So I don't ne necessarily think we would apply for this kind of thing. Great, thank you both. Other folks have any other questions, comments? I'll wait another few minutes, see if anything pops up in the Q&A. All right, well, not seeing any other questions um, or raised hands, I think we can go ahead and um, wrap up a little bit early today. Um, JoLynn, if you want to go to the next slide, I just want to um, wrap up and go through some next steps. Um, first off, I just want to thank all the panelists and the utility representatives that we heard from today. Um, and also thank you to all the members of the public and the stakeholders who called in and contributed to the panels and the discussion. Um, we really appreciate everyone's time and attention um, and the good ideas that were discussed. And um, the public process is really important to energy safety, and we welcome any feedback you may have on the workshop, including the structure, topics, timing. Um, you can email myself, Jessica McHale, or Nicole Dunlap um, regarding any feedback or suggestions that you may have. Um, in terms of next steps, Energy Safety will be posting the presentation slides to the 2023-2025 WMPs docket by close of business Monday, June 19th, um, and then the recording will also be made available on our website. Um, written and opening comment comments are due on um, all SMJU and ITO WMPs by June 29th, 2023, and reply comments are due on July 10th. Please submit those comments to our 2023-2025 WMPs docket. Um, and just this slide here um, has the link to the 2023-2025 docket, which is uh, your primary source of all information regarding the WMP evaluations. Um, and also data request responses are available at all the electric, electric corporations' websites and summaries of the DRs received um, by the utilities are available on our 2023-2025 WMP DRs docket. Um, and with that, I will conclude today's meeting. Thank you so much again, everybody, for taking the time out of your busy week to join us. We very much appreciate your participation and engagement. Thank you all and have a great weekend.